Thomas. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Three weeks ago today, 19 precious children and two beloved educators were killed in a senseless, and horrific act of violence. We offer our deepest heartfelt sympathies to Robb Elementary School and the entire Uvalde community as we hold in our hearts those families, friends, colleagues, mourning and incalculable loss. Families trust schools to be safe places for children and staff to learn and thrive. Violence in any form jeopardizes the sense of security that school buildings provide and is unacceptable. The board will continue to provide all necessary fiscal resources and supports to the school system to ensure that they can provide safe and welcoming places of learning for all students and staff. Every day, we know that families across Baltimore County trust this board and BCPS to keep your loved ones safe. Together, we are committed to doing just that. Thank you. The first item on the agenda tonight is consideration of the June 14th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? So Chairwoman Hen, <coughs> Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board, I would like to amend the agenda due to the lateness of the hour. Um, we are able to follow up with the board leadership and reschedule the following items. So the first item I would recommend, um, item N, based on consultation with the board chair, uh, the report on climate and culture. Item O, the report on grading and reporting. Uh, item P, which is a new business collective bargaining for master agreement. We are still finalizing the agreements with our collective bargaining units. Our goal is to have all five master agreements to come to the board for your review and then consideration at the board's July 12th board meet, July 12th, 2022 board meeting. Thank you. Those are my recommendations. Thank you, Dr. Williams. In accordance with board policy 8314, Unanimous consent of the board is required to remove an item from the agenda at the request of the superintendent. May I have a roll call vote to approve the changes as requested by Dr. Williams? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. I put I had a question on the chat. Yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, I would... Um, support this except for item P um, as that is a matter of um, some urgency in um, addressing our um, staff, our vital staff for the coming year. Um, Are you requesting to separate item P from the motion? Yes, please. I will separate item P then. May I have a roll call vote? on Ms. Mack. the removal? Yes. May I have a roll call vote, please, on the agenda changes? This is for item N and O. This is for items N and O. We'll consider item P at Mrs. Causey's request separately. Ms. Rowe? Ms. Causey? Yes. 
Miss Mack? Yes. Miss Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman? Miss Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. May I now have a roll call vote on removal of item P? Ms. Cover? Madam Chair, I have a question about that. That's why I want it separated. Ms. Causey, we're, we're, um, we will discuss it if um, the motion fails, but for now I'm calling the roll call vote on whether to keep it or um, the motion is to remove it from the agenda. If it remains on the agenda, we will discuss it. May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Cover? Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Ms. Mack, did you have an additional change? And then Ms. Jost, I believe you might have had a change. Do I need to make a motion? Okay. Yes, please. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Ms. Causey, I did not acknowledge you. Ms. Mack was next. Ms. Mack, go ahead. I have I, a point of order. What is your point of order? I believe you stated that for an agenda item to be deleted, it needed to be unanimous. But if I voted no, then it's not unanimous. Mr. Mercedes? Could you uh, that, that's that? correct. But uh, in light of the uh, subsequent vote on whether to include it or not, or def uh, defer, item P, uh, it was in effect a separate motion. Okay, so item P. I'm sorry. So item, item P, P is removed for tonight. Item P is removed from, from tonight's tonight. Tonight's agenda. Thank you. Ms. Matt? No, I don't, I'm sorry, could I, I'm seeking clarification. I don't Mr. understand what Mr. Mercedes said. Mr. Mercedes, would you please repeat that into your microphone? Yeah, I'm, Although, as Ms. Hen stated at the outset, uh, unanimous consent from the board is required to adopt the superintendent's proposed change. After the item got item P got separated out, a motion was then made separately just pertaining to the removal of item P from the agenda, uh, which passed. So item P is deferred from the agenda for tonight. So it was no longer made at the request of the superintendent, so it no longer requires a unanimous vote. Ms. Mack, go ahead with your motion. Yes, I move to uh, move items H, new business report on board policies, and T, unfinished business um, board policies to the July 12th meeting. Thank you. Is there a second? Yes, I second it. Thank, thank you for the seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Causey? Yes. Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Are there any further changes to tonight's agenda? Hearing none, the revised agenda is approved. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. Next on the agenda is a special order of business, recognizing our student member of the board, Mr. Christian Thomas. At this time, could Christian please join me and Dr. Williams at the front of the dais.
Cool. This way? Okay, this way? Got you. Whereas his passion for and role as a student leader began in elementary school, he started and led numerous clubs, including a middle level Future Business Leaders of America chapter, a Red Cross club, and a Democrats political group. He served on the youth advisory board for the American Red Cross National Capital Greater Chesapeake Region. He is the founder of the Maryland Association of Student Board Members and serves on the BCPS Mental Health Advisory Council. And whereas Christian's leadership activities are evident in his participation as a senator in the 2019 BCPS Model Congress on the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, as an intern for a youth activism app called Turn Up, and as a fellow for Congressman Jamie Raskin in 2021. He also co-founded a student-led nonprofit called the Domino Effect Initiative, which aims to cultivate better educational equity and opportunity for students in BCPS. And whereas Christian is to be commended with bringing honor to this school system as he continues his education at Yale University to major in political science. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Baltimore County assembled in regular session on the 14th day of June in the year 2022 expresses to Christian its fondest regards and gratitude for his services and be it further resolved that the board herewith extends its best wishes to Christian for happiness good health, and continued success in future endeavors, and directs a copy of this resolution to be recorded among the permanent records of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. <laughs> fellow, <laughs> fellow board members, I move that the board accept resolution 2022-11 in recognition of student member of the board, Christian Thomas. Is there a, may I have a second? Second. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Any objections? Okay. The board is unanimous. Congratulations, Christian. Lastly, I would like to recognize Ms. Roa Hassan, our incoming student member of the board for the 2022-2023 school year. Congratulations and look forward to welcoming you, Roa. Excited to see you here. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, 
right. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chairman McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. So moved, Matt. Do, do I have a motion? One second, Ms. Mack. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits E1 through E5? So moved, Mac. Is there a second? Second, Hager. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll? Mr. Thomas. Yes, I just have one question uh, for public session. Um, the number of retirements this year compared to previous years, is it about the same for this year or are there significantly more for this year? Yes, thank you for your question. When we reviewed our retirements this year, we did not notice a substantially a substantial increase over the prior three years. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board, I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. There are several, so bear with me. <laughs> for the position of principal, we have uh, 10. Principal for Church Lane Elementary School, Deer Park Middle Magnet School, Dumbarton Middle School, Dundalk High School, Hereford High School, Lansdowne Middle School, Orms Elementary School, Reisterstown Elementary School, Rogers Forge Elementary School, Sussex Elementary School. For assistant principal, for the following positions at Dogwood, Dogwood Elementary School, Dumbarton Middle School, Glenmar Elementary School, Johnny Cake Elementary School, Lansdowne Elementary School, Overly High School, Perry Hall Middle School, Rossville Elementary School, Sandy Plains Elementary School, Timber Grove Elementary School, and Westtown Elementary School. In addition, we have the Deputy General Counsel, Office of Law, Executive Director, Department of Schools, Executive Director, Department of Special Ed, Senior Operations Supervisor, Office of Transportation, Supervisor, Elementary Mathematics, Office of Mathematics, Supervisor, Enterprise Systems Engineering, Office of Network Support Services, Supervisor, Psychological Services, Office of Psychological Services, Supervisor, Related Services, Department of Special Ed, Accounting Ma Manager, Office of the Controller, Manager, Department of Employee Development and Training, Manager, Solutions Implementation, Office of Technology Solutions Development, Coordinator, Office of Title I, Coordinator, Performing Arts, Office of Performing Arts, Coordinator, Physical Education and Health, Office of Physical Education and Health, Specialist, Compliance, Department of, of Special Education, there are three positions, and Specialist, Non-Public Placement, Office of Placement. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit F1? So moved, Mac. Do I have a second? Second, second Thomas. Causey. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Williams? Yes. At this moment, I've been informed that our live stream is not working, so we will recess for about five minutes while IT um, takes a look at that. So. So close, so close. <laughs>
Okay, thanks again for everyone's patience. The meeting is now um, reconvened. Thank you. Dr. Williams? All right, we are at the time of our appointments. Uh, board members, we have several of our appointees present in the room with family members. So as I call your name, please stand. Our first appointed uh, staff member is Christopher M. Aiello uh, as the assistant principal at Perry Hall Middle School. He is new to Baltimore County Public Schools. He's coming from uh, as a educational director of High Road School of Prince George's County with six years and associate director of High Road School at Anne Arundel County and a special education. As, uh, excuse me, special education teacher. Attending tonight is his wife, Sarah. Please stand, Sarah. I think we have Principal Perry in the, in the room as well. Please stand. Okay, come on. The next appointee is Amy N. Bell, or Bill. Excuse me, as assistant principal of Dumbarton Middle School. Please stand. There she is. Uh, she brings to us 10 years of experience in our system. Uh, previously, she was the English teacher at Dundalk Middle School, a uh, teacher of library science media at Logan Elementary, a teacher of English at Western School of Technology, and previous experience in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Joining her this evening is Lisa Yost. Please stand, Lisa. Next appointee is Stephen Bender as the Executive Director of the Department of Schools. He brings to us 23 years of experience. Uh, currently, he's the principal of Vincent Farm Elementary School. Previous to that, he served as the assistant to the area assistant superintendent in the southeast area. He was the assistant principal of Charles Mount Elementary School, resource teacher at Mars State Elementary School, classroom teacher at Sparks Elementary School, and previous experience in Howard County Public Schools. Congratulations, Stephen Bender. <laughs> Next, we have Robert S. Covert as the principal at Hereford High School. Uh, he brings to us 13 years of experience. Uh, currently, he's serving as the assistant principal at Hereford High. Previously to that, he uh, served as a assistant principal at Overly High School, science teacher at Newtown High School. Congratulations. Oh, I'm sorry. And attending with them tonight is his wife, <laughs> Megan. Megan, please stand. Please. Our next appointee is Kama J. Dwyer as the supervisor related services department of yeah. special education. She brings to us over 26 years of experience. Currently, she is a resource teacher in the Office of Digital Safety and Education Technology and Library Media Education Technology. Previously to that, she served as a speech language pathologist in the Department of Special Education, Dumbarton Middle School, uh, speech language pathologist at Cockeyville Middle School and Herndon, Herndwood Elementary School. And joining her tonight is her husband, Paul Satterfield. Congratulations. Next is Melissa M. Forster as the coordinator of Office of Title I. She brings to us over 11 years of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, she served as the specialist in the Homeless Education the Office of Title I. Previous to that, she was a resource teacher in the Office of English Language Arts, pre-K to 12 elementary, classroom teacher at Bedford Elementary, 
previous to this, these experiences, she served uh, at Carroll County Public Schools and also was a part of the aspiring leader. Joining her this evening is her husband. <laughs> Next appointee is Pierre I. Francois as the manager, Department of Employee Development and Training. Uh, Mr. Francois brings 20 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, he is the administrative assistant too in the Department of Schools. Uh, previous to that, he served as the executive administrative assistant in the Division of Business Services, residency investigator in the Office of Student Support Services, administrative secretary three in the Office of Student Support Services, Administra administrative secretary three, Wellwood International, and Secretary One is Southwest Academy. Joining, uh, joining, joining him this evening. Yes, is his father with the same name, Pierre Francois. <laughs> Thank you. Our next appointee is Lori M. Grant as principal of Church Lane Elementary Technology School. She brings to us 16 years of experience. Currently, she's the assistant principal at Feather Bed Lane Elementary School. Prior to that, she served at Charles Mount Elementary School, Winfield Elementary School, classroom teacher at Dogwood Elementary, and aspiring leader in 2012. Uh, joining her this evening is her mother, Evelyn McClary. Please stand. Yeah. Is Jonathan D. Hughes as the principal of Deer Park Middle Magnus School. Mr. Hughes brings 12 years of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, he's the assistant principal at Randallstown High School. Uh, pr prior to that, he served as the social studies teacher at Northwest Academy of Health Services. Joining him this evening are his two sons, Jonathan and Jaden Hughes, who are Next, we have Craig I. Jacobs as the Senior Operations Supervisor in the Office of Transportation. There he is. He brings to us over 18 years of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, he's the field representative in the Office of Transportation. Prior to that, he serves as the routing assistant in the Office of Transportation, a school bus driver in the Office of Transportation. Attending tonight with him is his wife, Shayla Jacobs. Welcome, Shayla. Next, we have DeAndrea L. Jacobs as the supervisor in psychological services in the Office of Psychological Services. She brings to us over seven years of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, she serves as a school psychologist in the Office of Psychological Service. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have uh, next appointee is Shanta D. Jones as the assistant principal, Johnny Cake Elementary School. She brings to us three years of, of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, she is a teacher resource at Deer Park Middle Magnet. Uh, she served as a staff development teacher at Sudbrook uh, Middle Magnet. And prior experience includes uh, Teach for America and Baltimore City Public Schools. Attending with uh, Shanta N. Jones, D. Jones is Dana Holt. Please stand and welcome. <laughs> Next, we have Rachel L. McGill as the assistant principal at Rossville Elementary School. Oh, Rossville. Oh, there she is. She brings 12 years of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, she serves as a special education teacher, inclusion, Dunbar Middle School. Uh, prior to that, she served as a classroom teacher at Mays Chapel Elementary School. Vincent Farm Elementary School, Fort Garrison Elementary School. Joining uh, Rachel McGill is her husband, Brian McGill. Please stand and welcome. <laughs> Our next appointee is Allison R. Myers as the Executive Director, Department of Special Education. She brings 19 years of, of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the principal of White Oak. School. She served as a supervisor placement in the Office of Special Education, assistant principal at Ridgely Middle School, 
special ed teacher, Deep Creek Middle, and a part of their aspiring leader in 2018. Congratulations, Ms. Myers. <laughs> we have Justin M. O'Brien as the coordinator, Physical Education and Health, Office of Physical Education and Health. He brings to us six years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools. Currently, he was the supervisor of physical education uh, in the Office of Physical Education and Health. Prior experience, he served 15 years in Howard County Public Schools. And joining him tonight is his wife, Krista. Please join us instead. Thank you. Next, we have Jennifer L. Playkash as the assistant principal at Sandy Plains Elementary School. She brings 23 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she served as the resource teacher at Dundalk Elementary, consulting teacher in the Office of Staff Relations. Prior to that, she serves as a special ed teacher inclusion in du at Dundalk Elementary, uh, Wynant Elementary, classroom teacher at Wynant Elementary, and teacher special ed self-contained at Wynant Elementary. Uh, joining her this evening is principal at Dundalk Elementary, Jennifer Polarski. <laughs> Next, we have April A. Reed, assistant principal, Tim Timber Grove Elementary School. She brings over 10 years of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, she served as a classroom teacher at Cedarmere Elementary, kindergarten teacher at Cedarmere classroom teacher at Cedarmere. Joining her is her mother, Tanya Adams. Welcome, Miss Adams. And father. and father. Thank you, Dad. That wasn't on my notes, HR. Uh, <laughs> Carrie D. Dr uh, Real. Carrie D. Real, thank you. Assistant Principal, West Town Elementary School. She brings nine years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, currently, she served as the reading specialist at Owings Mill Elementary School, resource teacher and classroom teacher at Owings Mills Elementary School. Prior experience of uh, Volusia County Schools, uh, St. Peter's School, and Alamance School System for four months. Congratulations to Carrie D. Rill. Joining her this evening is her husband. Please stand and welcome. Next, we have Terrence Robinson, assistant principal at Overly High School. He brings to us 16 years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools. He currently serves as the assistant principal at Golden Ring Middle School, social studies teacher at Golden Ring Middle School, Windsor Mill Middle School, Milford Mill Academy, and special ed teacher, Milford Mill Academy. He, too, was a part of the aspiring leader um, program and cohort in 20. 12. Congratulations, Mr. Robinson. <laughs> Next appointee is Michelle A. Rowland as principal, Rogers Forge Elementary School. <laughs> <laughs> she brings 26 years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools. Currently, she served as assistant principal at Rogers Forge Elementary School. She served as a guidance counselor, classroom teacher, reading teacher, classroom teacher, all at Rogers Forge and a classroom teacher at Millbrook Elementary School. Attending with her is her husband, Gregory Rowland. Please stand and welcome. <laughs> you may have seen this person stand before, but Paul J. Satterfield, please stand. There he is, principal of Dundalk High School. He brings 25 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, Currently, he has been serving as the acting principal at Dundalk High School. He has had experience as assistant principal at Parkville High School, Eastern Tech High School, Kenwood High School. Also a classroom teacher, special education, Hollabird Middle, Pikesville High, teacher as leader program and aspiring leader program in 20, uh, 2001. Joining him, you've seen her stand before, <laughs> attending with him is his wife, Kama Dwyer. Our next appointee is Amanda L. Shane as principal, Dumbarton Middle School. She brings 23 years of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, she served at the, as the assistant principal at Perry Hall Middle School. Prior to that, she was a teacher of English at Perry Hall High School, Parkville High School, 
Dundalk Middle School and Perry Hall Middle School. Joining her this evening is her husband, Jeffrey Brian Shanks. Welcome. <laughs> Next, we have Emma Stephan as the Specialist in Compliance Department of Special Education. She brings, she is new to our system. Welcome. Uh, she has served in a variety of positions. The previous position was the Performance Monitoring Specialist in the Maryland State Department of Education. She's also served as Assistant Principal in Kent County High School, also a Principal at Errol Center for Education, Education Supervisor, also a Mathematics Teacher at Dumbarton Middle School. Welcome back home. Teacher of Special Education at Perry Hall High, and several other positions, including mathematics supervisor, the state of New Jersey, special ed educator in the state of New Jersey, and mathematics teacher, state of New Jersey. Congratulations, Stefan. Emma Stefan. <laughs> Next, we have Sonia Sinkowski as the coordinator, Performing Arts, Office of Performing Arts. She brings to us 15 years of experience. Currently, she served as the resource teacher in the Office of Performing Arts. She also served as a resource teacher in the Office of Physical Education, Health, and Dance, dance teacher at Patapsco High School, and also served in Anne Arundel County Public Schools and Baltimore City Public Schools. Joining her is her husband, Lee Sankowski. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Jennifer N. Zamansky as the principal of Sussex Elementary School. She brings 14 years of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, she's serving as the assistant principal at Norwood Elementary School, she ser as well as she served as assistant principal at Dundalk Elementary School. She has experience as a resource teacher at the Scholars 8, K-8, through classroom teacher at Logan Elementary School, classroom teacher at McCormick Elementary School. And joining her is the principal of Norwood Elementary School, Candace Stafford. Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Joseph S. Tang as the supervisor, Elementary Mathematics, Office of, of Mathematics. He brings to us 12 years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, previously, he served as the resource teacher in the Office of Mathematics, classroom, classroom teacher at Pandonia International Elementary School, Dundalk Elementary School. Joining him this evening is his wife, Anastasia. Welcome. And child. <laughs> and baby. Congratulations. Next uh, appointee is Norma P. Venanueva. As the Specialist Compliance Department of Special Ed, she is new to us. She's here. Um, previously, she served as the Director of Student Services at Nundo Verde Bilingual Public Schools. She's been a Special Ed uh, Coordinator and Transition Services Specialist. She serves as, served as a Program Development and Expansion Officer. She served as a Program Director in the Office of Special Education in D.C. Public Schools, Education Department uh, Director in the Community School of Maryland, the Director of Special Ed in Arlington Public Schools, and Special Ed Coordinator in Baltimore City Public Schools in several other positions in Baltimore City Public Schools. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. <laughs> Next, we have Corey M. Walsh, Specialist, Non-Public Placement, Office of Placement. She brings to us over six years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, currently, she had served as the resource teacher in the Department of Special Education, and prior experience included Shepherd Pratt, the Fort Bush School for over eight years, and the Pacific Autism Center. Attending tonight with her is her husband. Welcome. <laughs> Next, we have Ryan J. Warfell. As the principal, Lansdowne Middle School, he brings to us 18 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, he's serving as the assistant principal at Catonsville Middle. He served at Sudbrook Magnet Middle, Kenwood High School, and Lansdowne Middle. 
He also served as a mathematics teacher at Cockeysville Middle School. He too was a part of the aspiring leading leader cohort in 2006. Joining him tonight is his wife. Next, we have Sophie L. Wellzet as the assistant principal of Glenmar Elementary School. She brings to us nine years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she was serving as the community school facilitator at Sandy Plains Elementary School. She also served as a behavior interventionist at Sandy Plains Elementary School and special ed self-contained teacher at Sandy Plains Elementary School. Joining her tonight is her husband. Please stand and welcome. The next list are those who are not in attendance this evening. We have Gregory J. Barra as the accounted, accounting manager in the office of, con, of the controller. He has over three years of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, he's serving as the fiscal supervisor three in the office of the controller, general accounting. His previous experiences were in Howard County Public Schools. Congratulations, Gregory J. Barra. Next, we have Candace M. Brinkley, a principal of Reisterstown Elementary School, who is watching, hopefully, virtually tonight. The note <laughs> says she brings to us 15 years of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, she served as the assistant principal at Oakley uh, Elementary School, Millbrook Elementary School. She served as a school psychologist at Newtown Elementary School, Pinewood, both part-time, Lansdowne Middle, and Baltimore Highland Elementary, Lansdowne Middle again, and she too was a part of the aspiring leader, leadership cohort in 2016. Congratulations, Candace M. Brinkley. <laughs> Joseph Donnelly, Principal, Orem's Elementary School. He brings eight years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, he served as the assistant principal at Deep Creek Elementary School. Prior to that, at Sussex Elementary School. He was a special education teacher at Battle Grove Elementary, Elementary School, classroom teacher at McCormick Elementary School, and was a part of the Aspiring Leader Program in 2017. Congratulations, Joseph Donnelly. <laughs> Next position is John S. Oliver, assistant principal at Dogwood. Nope, that's not John. Let me finish. Uh, John S. Oliver, assistant principal at Dogwell Elementary School. He is served. He is new to Baltimore County Public Schools. He has served as assistant principal at Barack Obama Leadership Academy. He's been an instructional specialist, a teacher of business and accounting, and uh, served at Shelby County High School as a business and accounting teacher with over 14 years. Welcome, John S. Oliver. Next candidate appointee is Andrea J. Palmasano as the assistant principal of Lansdowne Elementary School. She brings 15 years of service. Currently, she served as the staff development teacher at Lansdowne Elementary School. Prior to that, she was a stat teacher at Franklin Middle School, Logan Elementary School, and a classroom teacher at Logan Elementary School. Congratulations, Andrea J. Palmasano. Coming to an end, folks. This is good stuff. <laughs> Next, we have Valerie A. Thompson, Deputy General Counsel, Office of Law. Currently, she served as the Senior Counsel, Office of Law. Prior experience includes Baltimore City uh, Department of Law um, and the Honorable Judith C. Ensor. Congratulations, Valerie A. Thompson. Next, we have Michelle Wagner as the Manager, Solutions Implementations, Office of Technology Solution Development. Uh, she served us for 22 years in Baltimore County Public Schools. Currently, she was the Supervisor, Solutions Development and Systems Management in the Office of Enterprise Application. She served as a team lead for web services, webmaster, and prior experience included DPI Business Info Systems uh, and the Interactive Services Associations. Congratulations, Michelle L. Wagner. <laughs> Next, we have William 
Willingham uh, Enterprise System Engineering Supervisor, Office of Network Sur Support Services. He brings el over 11 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, he serves as the in Enterprise Systems Engineer in the Office of Network Support Services, and prior experience includes data network for over 10 years. Congratulations, William Willingham. <laughs> Our final appointee is Jenna Urick as a specialist, Compliance Department of Special Education. She is new to Baltimore County Public Schools, so we welcome her. Uh, previously, she served as a resource teacher in the Department of Special Education. She is not new to us, I apologize. Um, and she has had prior experience in Anne Arundel Public Schools for nine years. Congratulations, Jenna Urick. Point of privilege, I want to thank all of our members of staffing, the members of our human resources, our executive directors, all those that participated in these interviews because it is a long process, but we appreciate and we're so excited about your new journey in your new position. And so tonight, board, I brought forth 37 appointments for this evening. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and congratulations to everyone. It's an exciting night. So. And thank you to, to those who could be here, and thank you to everyone watching at home. And hopefully you're watching at home. Our next item for the evening is public comment. And I'll give everyone a moment to exit stage right here. So public comment is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see the time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. It is the practice of this board to allow elected officials to provide their comments to the board. First to speak is Senator Charles Sidnor. Senator Sidnor, good evening and welcome.
Good evening and thank you for your time. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, there are four things that I wanted to touch on uh, in the time. One, uh, dealing with the uh, non-renewal of our chief auditor's position, the budget appropriation transfer, uh, the My View curriculum, and some of the recent news surrounding uh, our superintendent. So with regards to this uh, non-renewal of, of the chief auditor, what I wanted to state was uh, in looking at Robert's rules, while I acknowledge uh, the right to abstain uh, since no one can be compelled to vote, in the General Assembly, uh, that's not the case. In the General Assembly, when you s sit on the floor, there's an expectation that you will cast a vote either yay or nay unless there is some sort of a conflict in which in case you will abstain. If a member recuses themselves or abstains, I believe uh, they owe an explanation on the record as to why they have not voted yea or nay. I'm disappointed that board members did not give Ms. Barr nor their constituents the courtesy of an up or down vote and to hold back a vote without a conflict of interest, uh, denying her a seventh vote, I believe is unconscionable. Uh, because these votes affect people's lives. With respect to the budget appropriation transfer, uh, if it has not already, I'm encouraging this board to do what is in the best interest of our students. And I implore uh, that the uh, county council not play games with our children. If this county council wants to send a message, maybe it should do so via email or by phone. This board, I believe, must make the case uh, to the council to reconvene uh, before this fiscal year ends and to advocate that they approve the budget appropriation transfer. As you know, and we all know, the BAT has a tremendous impact on critical instructional programs for our students and is cr critical to us. So I hope that you do advocate that they reconsider. With regards to my view, I had an opportunity to listen to the presentation of my view, the English language arts curriculum uh, meeting, I guess this was on uh, May 19th, and was extremely satisfied with what I heard regarding this piloting at some of our schools. Um, there were some, during that meeting, there were some statistics that were cited talking about the lack of proficiency of our black male students with the current curriculum. And despite using the nine-year-old English language arts curriculum, when the curriculum committee had an opportunity to recommend uh, the curriculum contract, uh, the committee chair spoke out in opposition to this new curriculum proclaiming that now is not the time. Then I simply ask, when is the time? Should BCPS continue using a curriculum that data says is not no longer working? If this board is concerned with the proficiency of our, all of our students, it should approve this contract when it comes to this full board. Not doing so means that the continuing use of a curriculum whose utility has long passed and looks like we're purposefully uh, putting our system's children at a disadvantage. Uh, finally, with regards to uh, this issue that's coming up along with Dr. Williams, uh, I wanted to say, uh, and again, I think the county felt that it had a need to say uh, something about it because it puts in a, a substantial amount of money uh, to the school system, and, and, and I feel I have a say as well because the state also puts in a substantial amount of money in the school system. Um, and so with all sincerity, I must ask what kind of candidates does this board believe it will attract to work for our system? This board has undermined the permanent appointment of its last interim superintendent and is amping up pressure on its current superintendent who is under contract and who is currently being blamed for issues that are adversely affecting school systems statewide. The bus issues, school discipline issues, the stress felt by our teachers are not unique to Baltimore County. Without a question, the board has a duty to hold the superintendent accountable. From what I can tell from the public record, there is absolutely no reason why Dr. Williams is being subject to this toxic environment by the county government or this board. If he has done something not to move this school system in a direction to do so when, that he said he would do so when you all interviewed him, please share that with us. We certainly would like to know. Because I'll say at the time when this board hired him, I was 
advocating for Dr. Valido White. I did not want that change to happen, but it happened. And after three years, it seems that we want to unnecessarily destabilize uh, the school system once again. And again, I ask what for? The public would love to understand where he uniquely fell short. And I don't think the council nor the people who have been trying to make this case have made the case. And unless you do, uh, Dr. Williams will have my support. Thank you. Next is Delegate Sheila Ruth. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Madam, Madam Chair, Dr. Williams, and, and members of the board, for the record, I'm Delegate Sheila Ruth. I come before you today to speak in support of a diverse, inclusive, authentic, and accurate curriculum. I am not an educator or a curriculum expert, but I know quite a bit about children's books. I'm currently executive director of the Sybils Awards, a 501c3 nonprofit that seeks to improve childhood literacy by finding and honoring books with the highest literary quality and that children will eagerly devour. We also include diversity and authentic voices among our primary criteria. These criteria are essential for improving literacy and reading skills because when children see themselves in books, they are more likely to engage with the book, which encourages both a love of reading and the act of reading, which helps to develop those necessary skills. Diverse books not only encourage a love of reading, but they also teach acceptance, including self-acceptance and empathy. If children are to grow up to be good world citizens, it is also crucial that they be exposed to the richness of world cultures and religions and the full spectrum of race, ethnicity, economic situations, gender, and disability, and the full authentic sweep of history, both positive and negative. These are broad ideals that I hope uh, BCPS will embrace and not directed at any particular curriculum. However, I did also want to comment on the My View Literacy Elementary ELA curriculum that I believe you are considering tonight. I watched the curriculum committee meeting where this curriculum was presented and I was impressed and excited by the presentation. This sounds like exactly the kind of curriculum needed to engage children according to the principles I just discussed. I was surprised to hear the chair of the curriculum committee say that while she thinks it's important for children to see themselves in the curriculum, now is not the time because of a drop in student proficiency. If not now, when? If student proficiency is low and dropping under the current curriculum, isn't that exactly the time when a new curriculum is needed, especially one that engages children and gets them excited about reading? I urge the Board of Education to vote to approve the MyView ELA curriculum and also to consider the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion in making curriculum decisions going forward. On a final note, I wanted to express my gratitude to Dr. Williams for his steady leadership um, during these difficult times. These last couple of years have been defined, defined by an extraordinary event, a global pandemic, the likes of which we haven't seen in over a century. It's not an exaggeration to say that our current world has been shaped in almost every way by the COVID-19 pandemic. Student learning loss, social and emotional consequences, staff shortages, supply chain issues, and more are all consequences of the pandemic, not just here in Baltimore County, but around the country, everywhere. Dr. Williams has done an admirable job of keeping our students safe and healthy and managing the sometimes conflicting needs that have emerged from the pandemic. While there clearly are still problems and the problems need to be addressed, these problems will not be solved overnight. Dr. Williams has taken steps that will begin to address the issues, and I have confidence in his leadership to bring us through the crises and help us to emerge stronger than before. I thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Jeanette Young. Ms. Young? Okay. Good evening. Good evening.
Good evening, Chairwoman Hinn, uh, Vice Chair McMillan, and Dr. Williams. I come to you today representing the education support professionals of Baltimore County. My name is Jeanette Young of the education support professionals. ESP represent the health assistants, interpreters, office professionals, benefits, payroll clerks, paraeducator, and technician, just to name a few. These positions are often not the positions you think of when you think of adults within the school system. We are those who are behind the scene that keep the system running. Dr. Williams, thank you for taking the time to learn about our unique needs and value. You are the first superintendent who have shown a genuine interest in the working condition of anyone other than the classroom teacher. You transitioned from holding scheduled check the box meeting to engaging dialogue leading to a comprehensive, comprehensive understanding and acceptance of value in the ecosystem of Baltimore County Public Schools. Members of the Board of Education, we still have a lot of work to do. Please recall when the, when the all call went out for central office to support the needs in the schools, many ESPs member answered that call filling the schools and other centers office across the county. Dr. Williams saw we were essential in student success. Again, thank you, Dr. Williams, for recognize, recognizing I value. Currently, ESP has not reached a tenant agreement with BCPS um, on our master agreement. However, we've had some productive conversation and reached some agreements on some of our outstanding items. But one outstanding item remains is compensation. We are asking you, Board of Education, to act today and agree to the priorities the students of Baltimore County Public Schools by paying the staff. We need you to stand up, take a positive action to ensure students remain, uh, remain a priority for supporting all students, ESPs, and Dr. Williams. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Next is Leslie Weber. Good evening. Good evening, Chairperson Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Board of Education members, and Dr. Williams. I'm Leslie Weber, the Secretary and incoming President of the PTA Council of Baltimore County. I want to talk tonight about communication. Last week, Sue Han from the Office of Family and Community Engagement, who represents BCPS on our board, facil facilitated a transportation-related meeting between PTA Council board members, Chief of Staff Ms. Charlie Green, and Deputy Superintendent Dr. Yarbrough. In late April, PTA Council hosted a school safety program featuring presentations by Dr. Ford from the Department of School Safety and Sergeant Knox from the Baltimore County Police Department, who oversees SROs. We were happy that Dr. Zarch and Chief of Schools attended. My goal isn't to get into details about transportation and school safety. I do have to say that they're both complex and longstanding issues. At both sessions, it was refreshing to take part in open, honest conversation about tough problems. Throughout my years advocating for public schools and being a PTA leader, I've participated in many work groups and task forces and have taken many surveys. In many cases, it felt that the outcomes were already determined and that public input was needed to legitimize decisions made. Our recent transportation and safety related interactions with BCPS honestly felt different. I felt like both were brainstorming sessions to find solutions to difficult issues. Community concerns were recognized, including the extent of inappropriate and violent behavior in schools and on buses. We heard, heard that multi-pronged and creative event, uh, approaches are being worked out. My takeaway was that our opinion was and, and, and input were valued. I'd recommend not waiting until all stakeholder groups have been approached or until reforms are fully fleshed out to let the public know what's going on with major initiatives. Get ahead of the news cycle and social media. Let the community know that they've been heard, their concerns acknowledged, and that changes are coming, but that complex, issue, complex problems require multifaceted solutions, which take time. If community members, including students, family, staff, and stakeholders, are brought in to be part of the solution, the outcome will be better for all. Let's focus on where we need to be in terms of academic achievement and school climate and culture. Let's keep lines of communication open and collaborate to find innovative, innovative solutions, or maybe back to basics and common sense ones, to make BCPS what it needs to be for our students and staff. PTA Council looks forward to being a part of ongoing conversations. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next is Matthew Riedel. papers for you guys. Okay. guys. Thank you. Hi, Matthew. Good evening, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Hello, my name is Matthew Reedham. I'm a first grader at Warren Elementary. Uh, I'm here to talk about school meals. At first glance, the food doesn't look very good to eat. With closer inspection, they don't look good at all. There's mold, sometimes expired, and unhealthy ingredients. Does this look like a lunch to you? Would you eat this? I'm going to guess your answer was no. Well, I have first-hand experience of what these school lunch meals actually taste like, and they are not good. It's usually not enough food. I'm small. It doesn't even fill me up. What about older kids? I bet they're still hungry after lunchtime, too. Most of the options don't look like anything I would want to eat. They're poorly made and unappetizing. Just look at the packet of pictures I handed out, or this display board I have here, and you'll see what I mean. So when is a meat stick an acceptable option for lunch? It has a lot of salt and preservatives. The, and the yogurt box is just full of snacks. The Trix yogurt that is served contains sugar, as the second ingredient listed. We should also address the breakfast. Cookie bars are served for breakfast. Last I checked, that is a dessert, not a breakfast. Some cereal bars have marshmallows, which have lots of sugar. Also not great for breakfast. These are some of the big problems. This is not acceptable. I have some suggestions to fix this, so kids that depend on school meals don't go home starving. A good lunch should have better nutrition and healthy choices, like fresh salads, pasta, soups, and healthy sandwiches. You also need more, more variety. It seems to be the same terrible options every week. Also, the ser serving size need to be bigger, so kids are not hungry or allowed for second servings. What about serving eggs for breakfast, which has protein and vitamins to fill you up? It's cheap and it's easy. You can offer scrambled or hard boiled. In conclusion, isn't it common sense to provide food that is nutritious and also appetizing? Kids aren't dumb. They know this isn't right. This isn't a problem. It needs to be immediately addressed. You're the adult and you're the only ones who can fix this. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Matthew. Next, we have Billy Burke. It's going to be tough to follow that one, Billy. <laughs> Just my luck. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman, Mrs. Hen, Vice Chairman, Mr. McMillian, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight on behalf of CASE. I'd like to discuss three topics of concern. Uh, first, tonight you are voting on the MyView literacy contract. 100% of the administrators in the pilot felt the program was effective. CASE supports this contract tonight. As we all watch the county council not approve the BAT, we have become more and more concerned that the cost of living increase and the steps negotiated are no longer possible. It would be important for members to hear from the school system leadership and the Board of Education that they are committed to fair and appropriate compensation and will realign the allocated budget from the County Council to meet those goals. Most of the surrounding counties have figured this out and publicly announced the increases. I know we can do the same. The next topic of concern is the staffing shortage. I would like to offer some perspective on that challenge. The staffing shortage is a regional and national problem and won't be fixed quickly, so there are some steps that we need to take. No one wants to limit what classes are available to students, but we cannot continue to create schedules 
for teachers that don't exist. Students can't spend the entire year with a substitute or substitutes. We must prioritize. We must staff special education programs first. Then we must prioritize schools and programs with significant academic performance and behavioral challenges. We should limit courses to the teachers that are hired and exist. We should enhance online learning and independent learning options to meet the needs of students when not enough teachers are available. We cannot depend on central office staff to provide coverage. The jobs of central office staff provide critical support for schools and can't be stopped to cover classes. We are robbing Peter to pay Paul, and it is unsustainable. I'd like to end tonight by thanking the members of CASE and all BCPS staff for the heroic way you pushed through what has been arguably one of the most difficult years in education. I am amazed and inspired by your dedication and heart each day. You make the world a better place, and children and families thrive because of you. Examine what your critics have to say, change when you should, and guide your actions by your core values and what is right for children. Have a restful and soul-filling summer. You are superheroes. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Mrs. Cheryl Pasteur. Good evening, board leadership, Dr. Williams, school board members. Cry the beloved country for the unborn child that is the inheritor of our fear. A line from South African writer Alan Payton, who in 1948 wrote the universally acclaimed novel, Cry the Beloved Country, set in apartheid Africa. Skip to 1980, been in the storm so long by Leon Litwack. Skip again to June 4th, 2022, when the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission established by House Bill 307 on the impact of lynching around the state addressed professional, educational, psychological, and emotional implications and trauma today in our educational system as a result of our past. When will we come out of the storm and really take care of our children so our fears do not stifle them? From this board's Curriculum and Instruction Committee's denial of a recommendation to the full board for a contract which will positively change instruction for all children, regardless of race, but particularly those same children we have heard board members lament were being poorly educated, particularly black, brown, and economically disenfranchised, a contract which meets state standards and exemplifies which is required by COMA law. They have done this in favor of a curriculum which is over nine years old and has proven to be ineffective. Yes, the teachers are tired but they are tired of teaching a curriculum to children they care about who are in the gap, lacking the requisite skills. All should be incensed, a lack of equity. Now let's move to the county council attempting to upend the superintendent's tenure by holding hostage a budget needed to move our children forward just to get to the superintendent wrong. All of this leaving us saddened and outraged. If there's a concern, handle it as grown-ups and professionals in the name of children, in the name of civility, not for what appears to be self-serving. Where is the humanity and the civility? Where's the word children? I can clearly see the abyss now that I sit on this side of the table. Stop this trend of hatred. We in Bacapsi cry for this beloved country, for the unborn and the born children. They need to have a chance at equity and success. We want all of our children to get the best. Bacapsi insists that this board and county council do the same. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Cindy Sexton. McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. There are two days left in the school year, and we still have not come to an agreement on our contract. This is unacceptable. I've reached out to my counterparts and want to share that both Howard and Frederick counties are getting an average of 7% between Steps and Cola. Harford, 6.8. Prince George's is still negotiating, but they're going to get at least a 5% Cola with their Steps. The TABCO and BCPS negotiating teams have spent hours over the past year negotiating and over the past few years, over 100 hours to work on the salary scale compression. It will get educators to the top of the salary scale quicker, thereby increasing their career earnings. This makes us more competitive. But we know this wasn't implicitly funded in the county executive's budget, but we did hear that the school system has the ability to move funds around. What could possibly be more important than compensating our educators so they stay in our system? We will never raise the bar, close gaps, and prepare for the future if we don't have educators. You have heard me say from my very first board meeting in August 2019, fully staffed schools increase learning outcomes, improve morale, and decrease discipline concerns. And if you ask any educator, it is these three topics that are the biggest concerns right now. And while fully staffed classrooms won't magically fix the problems, they won't be fixed if we don't have educators in the school. I ask this board to fulfill its own motion where unanimously you prioritize compensation in people. Again, I ask for our students what could possibly be more important than attracting and retaining educators. Show the students of Baltimore County that they are worth it, that all is being done to provide them with all they need to be successful. On another quick note, I've had the pleasure of going to elementary schools and also being part of focus groups with the My View curriculum. I heard positives and negatives from teachers, but I can unequivocally say two things. First, Ms. Shea and her team responded to every concern and are committed to working with teachers and administrators to making this work. And second, the data show that the current curriculum is not improving student outcomes. Let's give our students the tools to be successful. Smile, Mr. Thomas, good luck in all you do. We're gonna miss you on the board. And to all the educators, support staff, administrators, all those who worked so hard during this most difficult year, thank you for all you have done for our students. You make a difference every day. Enjoy your summer. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Danita Tolson. Good evening. Greetings, Dr. Williams and the members of the Board of Education. Baltimore County NAACP supports Dr. Williams as the superintendent of the Baltimore County Public Schools. We are deeply troubled by the racism that has been shown and the barriers put in place to hinder Dr. Williams' progress to progress through the recovery from the pandemic. Dr. Williams has put in place concrete plans to address the challenges of the system. These are some of the same challenges that are across the nation. We have to continue to work with the Board of Education. We have to continue to work with Dr. Williams. The Baltimore County NAACP strongly urges the Baltimore County Board of Education to tune out distracting situations and continue to collaborate and to keep the student focus. Over the past two to three years, Dr. Williams faced many, many challenges. The pandemic, cyber attack, staffing shortages, curriculum, lack of support, and racism. Racism, racism from all directions. Consistency at this time is key to stability. Changing a superintendent is not beneficial to the students or the school system. 
The pattern I see is the continued removal of black superintendents. It is clear racism exists, or some would say modern day lynching. The Baltimore County NAACP president, myself, and the NAACP members, we continue to collaborate with the school system and the Board of Education. We appreciate the school system formulating community um, committees, which included the Baltimore County NAACP branch. The goal of the committee is to address the community concerns with effective strategies. Under Dr. Williams' leadership, multiple stakeholders have invested their time and talent to create solutions for the Baltimore County Schools. The NAACP will continue to monitor and work with the Baltimore County School System to try to resolve the issues and work with Dr. Williams. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron. This is for the central area, right? Yes. Good evening to all. My active members and I has finished 10 presentations for the past or passing school year and some 15 or more uh, business meeting to plan for the presentations. After our last session, I flew for my medical conference and I was looking through the window of BWI and I couldn't really um, help it, but to see some analogy between BWI and our system on my end. So you have the control tower up there. The control tower has the coordinates. And the control tower coordinates the planes to move around and fly in a safe and coordinated and effective manner. But if you imagine for a minute that the tower coordinator goes down to South Central Airline desk and chooses who is the gatekeeper there, which employees are being um, allowed to serve on that desk in that airline, and who is not. That would be a distraction of the important function of the tower. And I always really look for analogies from other industries. I think the school system, and I said it multiple times, and I'm really not tired of it, the school system can learn good things from the industry outside. And I chose for you the BWI because it's really a government agency. So the tower function is really important by itself, coordination, but when it gets mixed with the function of the desk in the council or the airline in that instance, it becomes problematic. Furthermore, think about the airplane employees. They are not hired there because of their family and friends kind of things. They are hired there for their abilities. Age doesn't matter. I've seen old people in airplanes. But what counts is what's inside. It's their ability to do the work. And I really hope that you, the Board of Education, that you support me in what I'm trying to do in this central area. I thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brian Epps. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman, Chairwoman Hinn, Vice Chair McMillan, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and board members at large. As president of ASME Local 434 of Baltimore County Public Schools, I would like to, to express my support for Dr. Williams and his leadership. 
I was proud, I was proud to be joined this past Saturday by 87 ASME members across all classifications and positions by voting 100% to ratify our tentatively agreement for the 2022-2023 school year. This is, this is only possible because of the positive change in recognizing and respecting that we received from the, uh, that we received under the leadership of Dr. Wim, Dr. Williams. This is the first time that Ask Me and other support uh, unions have been brought to the table to share a problem solving collaboration with the superintendent. We now have regular focused meetings and concerns and, and share our concerns and supports to the system. We are in the midst of a national bus driver shortage across the country. We cannot blame Dr. Williams for that. Our, our dedicated drivers and attendants hard working to hardly work hard working to support uh, transport now students at this difficult time. I would like to express my appreciation for the leadership and our elective officials who have taken time to understand and to recognize the hard work of ASME members and food service facilities, operation, as well as transportation. These members are, are going above and beyond to meet the needs of students and families in this challenging time. We know that there's more work to be done and our current structure put us in a place to continue to work together to meet the needs of Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nick Argeros. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Woman Hand, Vice Chair McMillan, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I represent the Organization of Professional Employees. During the last two years, our school system has been through some difficult times with a pandemic and cyber attack. A change in leadership that would result in further unnecessary disruption to our school system is a concern for many of us. Significant and under uncertain changes would impact the welfare of our students and staff who are just beginning to enjoy some normalcy again. The hiring shortages we face in our organization are widespread in many industries and education systems and cannot be solved quickly. We should give the mitigation strategies we have in place time to work and invite all stakeholders to participate in helping us develop solutions that will best serve our students and staff. We should continue to move forward to attain normal operations, not disrupt progress, and not further complicate things for our students and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Samantha Werfel. Oh. Welcome. Okay. Oh, welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no, welcome. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Samantha Warfell, and I am currently serving in my second term as the Baltimore County Student Council's president and gearing up for my third and final term next year. I wanted to come to today's board, uh, board meeting to give you some final updates as to our year and the year that we had this year. Um, and we've had a great one. So I'm going to go ahead and start kind of listing off some things that I'd like to share with you all. So first and foremost, we've celebrated the strides of our newest committees, the Diversity and Equity Affairs Committees Committee, which is in place to have conversations about our organization's accountability and to promote equitable practices and prioritize those practices, as well as the SMOB Elections Committee, which has helped us to shatter voting participation and garner over 12,000 votes in this year's SMOB election. Congratulations, Rella. Um, and this, this committee, uh, with the help of our officers and our current small up, Christian Thomas, we worked together to um, create legislation that would, that would also allow our candidates to, uh, to garner as much um, public participation and, again, contributed to that, um, that exceptional vote count that we only look forward to seeing increase in the future as this, this process becomes more widespread and more accessible to all of our students. 
We also look forward to the addition of our publications committee uh, coming in this coming year to advance our idea and our value of accessibility to students around the county. Back in September, we kicked off our year with the virtual fall camp, and we sent each school boxes of resources and workshop materials, which is a really great way um, to bring a once very hands-on and in-person event um, to our schools in a way that was still fun and engaging. We've held consistently scheduled general, general assembly meetings, which have brought students around the county together, which have been as fun as always. And we also executed our first ever four-part school safety series that featured aspects of implicit bias training as we face raising, rising rates of violence in schools, which is unacceptable. And our students see it, they're hurting, and we're coming together to work towards solutions that, and steps that we can take together um, to prevent these, these tragic incidents. We also saw the incredible leadership born of our foundational and historic document marking the formation of the Baltimore County Junior Councils and held elections for BCSC as well as BCJC for the upcoming school year. Most recently, we participated in a meeting with um, excellent staff from BCPS Central Office regarding transportation. And we talked to these staff members um, about issues with transportation, bus overcrowding, bus driver shortages, but also some really exciting um, plans for the future in terms of programs to make transportation more accessible and uh, easier for, for students and parents. I would just like to say um, that this summer we are excited to, to work toward equity. <laughs> Thank you. Next is general public comment and our first speaker is Jean Milstein. Good evening. Good evening. Four years ago, I watched my mother-in-law, Liz, die of acute respiratory distress syndrome, the same syndrome that kills people infected with COVID. What it is, is a slow and painful waiting game. It means learning that your loved one's lungs are damaged potentially beyond repair. It's titrating levels of consciousness so that the doctors can assess how much prolonged oxygen deprivation has affected cognitive function without causing massive discomfort. It's tubes and wires and literal blood pumping through machines. It's celebrations of incremental successes tempered with terrifying regressions. It's adrenaline-fueled wrong number phone calls at 11 o'clock at night for pizzas that you didn't order and 3 a.m. phone calls in which you learn your husband has lost his mother. In short, it's a fate that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy, and I will do everything in my power to make sure I play no part in it happening to friends or loved ones. I was talking to a colleague the other day. We were reminiscing about the beginning of the school year when our desks were as spaced out as possible and everyone was wearing masks. COVID was still scary then. Over time, it has become less so. With vaccines and new treatments for stalling severe outcomes, things at the end of the year seem a little closer to normal than they were at the beginning. That said, we are not done. The storm is not over. A widely circulating meme that I saw often at the beginning of the pandemic states, we are all in the same storm. But I especially like the addendum of, but we are not all in the same boat. That is still true today. My sister's family weathered COVID easily, 10 days of COVID leave, some flexibility with daycare and a couple of uncomfortable days, and the entire family was whole again. But that isn't true for everyone. It isn't true for Jose, who loves school. Jose lives with his grandparents, parents, aunts, and uncles, some of whom are over 80 years old and are at great risk if Jose catches COVID from a classmate. It isn't true for Ben, a AAA who works hard every day to support John. John is non-speaking and can't tell Ben that his throat hurts. Ben works three jobs trying to make ends meet. He can't afford to take off to get his booster and he can't afford to get COVID either. And if he does get COVID and needs to be hospitalized, he doesn't have health insurance. I still wear my mask. I wear my mask for Jose. I wear my mask for Ben. I wear my mask for my cancer surviving father-in-law. Masks aren't perfect. Neither are vaccines or the antivirals, but every mitigation strategy we implement is one more layer of protection for Jose and for Ben. If we tilt towards higher levels of COVID transmission, if hospitalization rates increase, I'm asking you to please not take masking off the table. We are all in the same storm. We are not all on the same boat. Some of us are on the beach ready to party, 
but others aren't. They're still drowning, and I refuse to idly watch from the shore. Our next speaker is Marisol Johnson. Welcome. All right, it's good to see everyone. Um, first, I want to say congratulations to all the students finishing out 2022. Um, congratulations. And uh, especially to my daughter, she's one of the middle ones. She just graduated from eighth grade today from Subbrook Magnet Middle School. So I just want to say shout out to her um, and to the BCPS staff for doing the very best with what they have um, to help our children thrive and feel safe even when they don't feel the same. So as an active parent in the BCPS community, a multicultural woman who runs a thriving business in Baltimore County, and a former member and the vice chair of this very school board, it has been brought to my attention that you might be determining whether or not to embark on yet another superintendent search. An interesting undertaking uh, during a very busy end of school year. I will also echo the opinions of those who want to allow Dr. Williams to see his contract through um, while once and for all receiving the support from the board that he deserves. Ladies and gentlemen of this board, you hired him. You hired a search team, you vetted him, you interviewed him, you Googled him, and then you voted him in. Um, you ushered in the third superintendent in four to five years, four or five years, um, and you all know better than most that Dr. Williams, he faced some enormous struggles. He, uh, he navigated through the system through the, the COVID shutdown, mask mandates and recalls, teacher turnover and shortage, a very costly cyber attack, perpetually fractured board security and safety issues, and now a county council with animosity and an ax to grind. It's my humble observation that it would be premature to request a bid for the soup search prior to the, the required contract negotiation that's coming up this fall or winter anyway. So if you're trying to make one last mark or make one last sweeping decision before you step down or run for your election, this is not it. Instead, fight, to support, fight for support staff for our vulnerable children and for the ones that are shining and already and need to be challenged a little bit more to keep shining. Fight for more di a di more diverse uh, teacher population. Fight for those students uh, to be learning at the right grade level. Fight for funds to pay our teachers more. Speaking of teachers, we all know what, what happens when the new superintendent comes along, comes large administration changes, um, changes in culture and climate, metrics, some sort of blueprint, something or other. And um, who does that affect? Teachers. Just because, uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. I voted for changes in the system that in hindsight I would have done differently. Board, board chair, a letter from the council forced an emergency meeting, so I assume. But no, actually a letter from five county council members forced an emergency meeting about a topic where you guys are probably already discussing as a board or individuals. Tom Quirk defers to Julie, which is good, but only after he calls Dr. Williams, Dr. Williams incompetent. David Marks wants Dr. Williams to mitigate the school bus. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferrone. I'd like to sell you an idea and I really hope you would take it. So please be patient with me. So the county council asked Dr. William to be changed, but they didn't give him money, right? And I have been uh, here for 25 years. Dr. Williams is the number six superintendent that I worked with. The first one was Dr. Berger. And the politics of funding always played out, always. So I have an idea for you. You are an independent board of education, but truly, even though you are independent, you are not. 
because fiscally, you really rely on the county and the state. No one can be independent without having their income. So I like you to consider tax levying authority. So if you have that power in you, all right, you will have a bucket, all right? And TAPCO comes to you and say, I want more money for my teachers. You will say, bucket. And ask me wants more money for the bus drivers, put it in the bucket. And everybody else put it in. And then you present it to the public direct. And you ask them for permission. And if the public wants to pay the teachers more and the bus drivers more and everything else, that's fine. Raise taxes. If the public says, no, this is too much, then you have to find some other solutions. But honestly, over the past 25 years, I don't know if this system ever would be fixed as long as always there is this purse string politics coming in and really directing the system one way or the other. The system needs to be independent. You take care of curriculum, you take care of the kids' needs, you levy your own taxes, the money is there. The county says 50% we are giving to the school system. I mean, it's not really their money, it's being collected for education, all right? You might want to collect it yourself. So, in 20 seconds, the ones who are not going to be board members, I think are ideal to lobby Annapolis for a change of Comar. Ideal. I know I can't do it by myself, but I'll be glad to be one. I thank you. Thank you. Next is Megan Hughes. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Superintendent Williams of the, um, and members of the board. Congratulations to all students and teachers for completing another school year, almost. Uh, tonight you will vote on my view literacy curriculum and I wanted to share some of my concerns. First, I want to mention that I saw some of the curriculum meeting and understand the passion some of you have for this curriculum. The fact that it has culturally relevant reading con content and we live in a majority minority school dist district is something that makes sense to highly consider. Every child wants to see themselves in material that they read, and the hope is that that would draw them into the content and get them more excited about reading. However, there are some negatives that may outweigh the positive. Some of these issues include that the stories are too long, not enough support or time spent on each skill, not enough grammar and spelling. It's difficult for students who are not on grade level, and most teachers need to spend out-of-pocket money in order to supplement the curriculum. How much money should teachers be required to pay out of pocket for a curriculum to work? Here are just a few quotes of the many directly from teachers about this curriculum. The skills are not taught to mastery. The questions that go with the text are basic and they don't match the assessment rigor at all. Long texts that are higher level. Components seem very disconnected from each other. Jumps around all over the place. The online component is not user friendly, not a fan at all. Pros, the textbooks are consumables. The kids can write in them. Cons, the level of readers are way too high for most of my kids. Some stories are very long for the age group. They also don't give you many worksheets to practice skills, so you end up supplementing a ton. Teachers and students hate, all hate it. So hard to use, so many holes in unsupported lessons and standards. We have to supplement everything and have used twice the usual copy paper this year. And the last one is please help. For those of you who have figured out how to do each lesson in one week without missing key components, please share with me how to do it. Because the stories are so long, it takes my students two to three days to choral read it together. I need to be sure to teach comprehension, phonics, spelling, vocab, language conventions, and writing. I just can't wrap my head around how to do this beginning Monday and test it all on Friday. Please help. The pilot program included 22 BCPS schools that used the curriculum for four weeks, and I believe it was during state testing, a stressful time. I know there were teachers in BCPS that piloted this program and hated it, but I've been asked not to mention them, their name for fear of retribution. The teachers are the implementers of this curriculum, and if the implementers hate it, why would we move forward with it at a time when we are losing so many teachers? $10 million is a lot to spend on a curriculum, and I just ask all of you on the board to really think about what is best for all Baltimore County students. Recently, Stacker compiled a list of the best school districts in Maryland, and Baltimore County isn't even the top 10. I remember when we were in the top three in the state. 
The 2019 MCAP scores showed ELA proficiency in Baltimore County at 37% for third grade, 40% for fourth grade, and 40% for fifth grade. Not the greatest numbers, but the numbers from 2021 during COVID are much worse. 26% proficiency in third grade, 25% in fourth grade, and 25% in fifth grade. My final question for you to think about is, do you believe this curriculum will help increase proficiency in ELA for elementary, our elementary school students? Will this curriculum give our students their best shot at their best future? And that's what you have to ask yourselves. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Omar Rashid. Welcome, Omar. Thank you. Good to see you. Nice to see you too. Nice to see all of you. Good evening, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice President, Smob Christian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. It's great to be back here and address all of you. My name is Omar Rashid, former student member of the Baltimore County Board of Education. I am here today driving an hour and a half from Washington, D.C. at the peak of rush hour after reading articles on the potential outsing of our superintendent to talk about nothing but the students and the support that I have for Dr. Williams being the leader running our school system for our students. The challenges that we have faced over the past two years have been like none other. We have faced loss of loved ones, complete school shutdowns, and all our social norms altered. During such a unique and difficult time in our lives, Dr. Williams stood his ground and ensured our students had the access to the education that they deserved. He also did his due diligence to communicate the work that had been done throughout his leadership. Despite the challenges that COVID-19 introduced, Dr. Williams still took on numerous initiatives to make our school system better. I started my term on the board the same time as Dr. Williams, and I have never met someone as eager and happy to serve all 111,000 plus students of BCPS with everything in him, and he has not lost that spark throughout everything. Members of the board, our focus should be on how to move forward. How can we make BCPS stronger than ever for the sake of our students? Today, more than ever, our students and staff need stability. And we are just starting to see some of that right now. We are all here for the students, and I know Dr. Williams is too. If any leaders in the community have recommendations, ideas, thoughts, or feedback, I urge you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Williams because I know he will welcome it. We are all here for the students. The decisions and changes made are going to have a direct impact on the students outside this classroom. Now is the time for us to unite and implement the changes we want to see within BCPS for none other than the students. Please, 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 do not allow the outside politics or any outside factor to sway you to make a vote that does not benefit the students. I've seen it firsthand, and I hope everyone on this board is strong enough to not let certain powers tell them what to do. You don't work for them, you work for the students. Thank you, and have a blessed evening. Thanks, Omar. Next, we have Lloyd Allen. Good evening. Good evening. I wanted to go before Jenny. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. Mr. Thomas, good luck on your journey. I'm Lloyd Allen, he, him, special educator in mathematics in Baltimore County, but I wasn't always a teacher. In summer 94, as a recent high school graduate, I was happy to earn $7 an hour to do data entry as a temp in Columbus, Ohio. As an 18-year-old living with my parents waiting for college to start, any money that I earned was turned directly into CDs from BMG. Dave and I worked as a team. One of us would read a string of numbers off a printout while the other typed, and then the person who had just finished typing would read their, would read their numbers off the screen to verify they matched the printout. Dave knew all the best places to get a good deal. For lunch, he would take the group to the Great American Bread Shop for the gigantic free samples slathered with butter and jelly. 
he was not a privileged 18-year-old living with his parents. He was a 43-year-old breadwinner with two children. The money that was gravy for me, $2 above minimum wage, was federal poverty wage for his family. As temps, we did not have benefits. Three weeks into the summer, Dave achieved the dream that he had been talking about since I had met him. He got a government job with living wage and health care for his family. All of my temp co-workers were working hard to tread water, and to a one, they were seeking that government job with benefits in order to support their families. Fast forward a year, and summer before some sophomore year, I was living in New York City, temping in accounts payable for a different international megabank. As before, my fingerprinting slash background check was covered by the client and turned around overnight. My hourly rates doubled to $15. Imagine my surprise when I processed an invoice with the line item, Lloyd Allen. Part of my contract stated that I could never ask how much the client was spending on me. But when I processed that check, I saw that for every $15 that I received, the client was paying 200. That made me think for a minute. When I hear suggestions that we outsource various services, transportation, speech language, ASL interpretation, it makes me stop and think. What's the upcharge compared to hiring directly? Rather than endanger the fidelity of public education by privatizing operations, reduce barriers of entry for our own potential employees, expedite fingerprinting, form relationships with local colleges, connect our students with training programs or majors relevant to our staffing shortages so that they may become our employees, cover costs contingent on future service. Now that I'm working for the government, I'm finding that some of my colleagues don't actually have the government job that Dave was looking for. Compensate all of our employees appropriately. In the long term, raising salaries competitively and providing benefits is more cost effective than outsourcing to vendors who are not even guaranteed to be successful with their recruiting. There may be national shortages, but our Metro has plenty of folks looking for work. Treat each person who serves or will serve our children in any capacity all the way up to superintendent as the asset that they are. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andy Higgins. Good evening. Okay. Uh, good evening, Chair, Vice Chair, Dr. Uh, Williams, and the rest of the board. Um, the first time I met uh, Dr. Williams was the first time I ever came to a Baltimore County Public School meeting. And um, it went really long. I didn't know it went that long. <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir. Um, <laughs> And so what struck me was after the meeting, uh, Dr. Williams stayed behind to talk to other uh, board members and um, members of the general public. And so uh, when he met me, he gave me his card and he said, hey, if you need anything, you can call my office or call me and I'll take care of it. And so my chest pumped up a little bit. I felt kind of special until I saw him do the same thing to like five other people. <laughs> Just stole my thunder. <laughs> so at the moment, I figured it was like, you know, political speak until I actually um, needed him, and I called on him. And it seemed like as soon as I pressed send, um, I had multiple people from his office uh, contacting me, um, and I felt special again. Um, and the, the sense of support, uh, the way that they extended themselves for me um, to a person, it was consistent and it was the same. And, and it established to me that it was a culture, and a culture came from one person. And um, it was consistent throughout my time, and it has been consistent throughout my time uh, working with uh, uh, Dr. Williams, and I appreciate you for that. Um, so you can imagine how startled I was when I saw that a few uh, members of the county council uh, wrote the letter that they did. It was uh, shocking, um, and shockingly short-sighted, quite honestly. Um, a few months from now, most of the faces that are looking at all of us from up there will be completely different. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the council will be different. And so you have a lot of people in these brand new positions. Um, they'll take some time to get adjusted. I'm sure you'll help with that, but um, it'll be new for them. And so the notion of changing superintendents along with the majority of the school board and somehow that's going to benefit our children um, is offensive. And I'm surprised that um, that happened. And so... Uh, not only 
have you um, have I experienced a lot of amazing things working with your uh, staff? But in my position, I'm on the leadership uh, council of the PTSA board at Newtown High School. I routinely heard from other parents, and they expressed the same thing. Uh, so I'm here to give my vote of confidence to you. Uh, thank you for the service that you've given us thus far, and I look forward to working with you in the future. And also, uh, Miss Scott. I appreciate you. I will be sad to see you gone next year, but I thank you so much for everything you've done for our district. Uh, you mean a lot to me, and you've been a mentor and um, a source of pride for a lot of us. So thank you all for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Josh, Josh Mahamza. Welcome. <laughs> Good to see you, Josh. Good evening. Sorry. Good evening, Chair Head, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I want to first recognize our outgoing and incoming SMOBs, Mr. Thomas and Ms. Hassan, respectfully. I have had the pleasure of working with both passionate leaders, and I want to sincerely thank them for their service to the students of ECPS. My name is Joshua Mahamza, former student member of the Board of Education, a current undergraduate student at Yale University, and a resident of this great county. I hope to return here. Uh, to this boardroom in a ce celebratory mood. However, I come perturbed by the current state of affairs concerning this board and the future of the school system, specifically the dismissal of important system personnel and the gross political influence by the county council concerning the superintendency. During my term, I was alarmed by the number of senior staff leaving the school system and raised this with fellow board members and Dr. Williams. Lately, even after the superintendent implemented uh, a cabinet reshuffle, it has become clear that this board has made it difficult for the superintendent to appoint and maintain experienced personnel. I was alarmed by the bizarre vote that took place last boarding, board meeting to not renew the contract of the board's independent chief auditor, Ms. Andrea Barr. I understand this board must toe the line when it comes to closed session matters. However, this board has several questions that I believe you must discuss amongst yourself. One, was that vote in any way retaliation for the chief auditor's investigation into ethics violations by the board? What has the board done to, to what the, has the board done to investigate and reprimand the board members identified in the recent WYPR article who will, uh, allegedly harassed the former chief auditor? And three, what steps will the board under your leadership, Madam Chair, take to maintain professionalism and independence when it comes to the board's relationship with central office staff? Although Dr. Williams sets the agenda for staff, this, uh, this school system will continue to falter if this board doesn't address its toxicity, which has contributed to a poor working culture, causing many highly qualified individuals to either leave the system or not consider applying at all. Now I will address our disingenuous county council. If the partisanship at the historic courthouse isn't enough, the council wants to infect their dishonest politicking onto the role of superintendent. In their letter, they identified a number of issues which must be noted have occurred nationwide due to the pandemic to inculpate Dr. Williams, saying that he has, done, he has had three years and hasn't produced results. Paradoxically, many of them have, have or will have served three terms where they too played an important role on, ed on the education of this county. This letter also comes on the uh, heels of their denial of a routine budget transfer uh, to address uh, a major uh, issue uh, in Baltimore County. If this board does move forward with the superintendent search, I ask that the process is judicious and that Dr. Williams is given a fair assessment. It will be troubling that this board gets rid of him with hardly giving him a, a ample time and opportunity to implement his strategic plan as the school system is trying to get operations back to normal. I would also like to caution this board on the consequences of allowing the county council to politicize the selection of superintendent during this. Thank you. Next is public comment on board policy. And I'm sorry. Is that listed? I'm, I'm sorry. Mr. Keith Stith. General public comment, our final speaker. Thank you, Ms. Gover. Apologies, Mr. Stith. Welcome. My name is Smith. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, evening. Dr. Williams, members of the board. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. My name is Keith Stith. I'm the poll mark of the Towson Catonsville Alumni Chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Our fraternity is uh, 111 years old. Um, my chapter is eight months old, and, a, and a, a, a specific program that is a tenant of Kappa Alpha Psi is called Guide Right. 
It's a program that focuses in on um, educating youth, both socially, academically, and uh, intellectually to try to grow young men in the community. Um, I'm here to support Dr. Williams and a key uh, element of his strategic plan. Uh, basically, that element is, uh, that element promotes the, uh, promotes community engagement and partnership uh, amongst uh, the community. In October of 2021, our website received an inquiry from Dr. Wims inviting us to partner with the Baltimore County Public Schools to do that very thing that is his element, one of his elements. In doing so, um, we jumped at the opportunity because it is what we do. So we thought it a great opportunity for us to engage in the schools. We then met with Dr. Williams and members of his team. We dealt with a vision, and with that vision, we came to an understanding that Dr. Williams asked us to concentrate on middle school boys. That's our element. Having done so, we, with Dr. Williams' team, we uh, met with leaders at Catonsville Middle, Dumbarton Middle, and Lansdowne Middle. Uh, and uh, we had an agreement on working with those in those schools. At Catonsville, we did a ground uh, uh, a groundkeeping operation where we beautified the campus. At Dumbarton, we started a mentoring program wherein we could um, engage with the young men at that school. And at Lansdowne, we executed in, con in conjunction with Lansdowne's own technical team a technical fair where we introduced drones, we introduced robotics, computer art, and other elements to stimulate the young folks there uh, to understand how technology can be fun. I drafted a letter to Dr. Williams apprising him of our progress, and I also shared that letter with the board, so hopefully you all have a chance to read it. I will say this, um, in, in, in terms of our future with this, our chapter will continue to work within the school system to continue to promote mentorship, also STEM training and others. In conclusion, uh, we and the members of my chapter, we support Dr. Williams and look forward to his vision as we look at the school system going forward. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Next we have board, uh, public comment on board policy. And first is policy 3230, our first speaker, um, Rebecca Milinek. Good evening. I saw a cough drop in my mouth. Um, so I'd like to give you a sense of what the lack of transportation looks like on the ground <clears throat> before you make some decisions around it. My name is Rebecca Malenik, and I am both a BCPS teacher and a parent. This morning, I heard peals of thunder, and my heart dropped. This is because I knew it meant that my 11-year-old daughter would need to spend roughly 40 minutes standing in the rain as she waited for her school's doors to open. Why? Because for the past year, she has not had reliable bus transportation. <clears throat> this year, the bus for my middle school daughter calls out more often than it arrives. Some days I will get a text notification at 7.30, which is far too late to make alternative plans. Today there was no notification at all. The bus simply never came. When my, when my daughter cannot take the bus, it requires me to either arrive late for my own work or to drop off my 11-year-old unattended in front of a school building that will be locked for the next 35 minutes. I have had to drop her off in the snow, in the rain, and for most of the school year, in the dark. She's in the same situation after school. In the most ideal circumstances, I pick my daughter up 40 minutes after her school day has ended. She has witnessed multiple violent confrontations on these occasions, as the school parking lot and surrounding area is packed with students waiting for buses that will not come, a situation that leaves them primed for conflict. At least twice, I've had to park down the road and walk past police cars in order to retrieve my daughter. 
We place an emphasis in this county on the social emotional well-being of our teachers and students. The lack of reliable transportation is directly responsible for eroding the social stability of students before and after school. It is directly responsible for increasing stress for both students and the parents who now have to choose between the safety of their own children and their responsibilities as teachers. There is a national staffing crisis, granted, but an institution devoted to the care and support of children should not counter this by simply shrugging shoulders and giving up. BCPS has a duty to solve the issues around bus transportation. If they want to maintain any credibility for providing equitable access to education for all students, there can be no access to education if we can't even get students into the buildings. We have a responsibility to these children to provide them with a safe, stable environment. By not providing them with reliable transportation, we have undermined this core concept before the school day has even begun. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So eight. Okay. Eight is off the agenda. Maybe we'll go through. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Board Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board. I am pleased to present my superintendent's report to the board and team BCPS. Just a reminder, we deferred some the item before the report. Okay. The teacher is still in me, Christina. The, my report includes an end of the year recap, operational updates and, and evidence of our strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence in action. Next slide, please. This year, our efforts to heal, rebuild and recover have been ongoing. The return to five day in person learning has not has not been without challenge. However, today we continue to move forward to meet the ongoing needs of Team BCPS. This end of the year video highlights our success in the face of challenge. The incredible tenacity and perseverance of Team BCPS is evident. Let's take a look. The 2021-2022 school year has come to an end. After nearly 18 months of COVID-19 related disruptions and nationwide school building closures, more than 111,000 BCPS students and 20,000 teachers, administrators, and support staff returned to school buildings at the start of the school year for full-time, in-person learning five days a week. With a reopening plan focused on COVID-19 safety, healing, recovery, and rebuilding, students and staff returned with much excitement. Staff worked to provide high quality education for all students, focused on equity, raising the bar, closing gaps, and preparing each student for the future. It's been really special to me to be able to be back at school, see friends, and they really welcomed me to the school because, you know, as you can see, I'm a, I'm a handicap, and just to hang out with all the people that you love at school. I love being in Logan Elementary because th there is amazing teachers and I learn more, much better when a teacher is in front of me in person instead of a computer. Team BCPS accomplished great things this school year despite the many challenges the school system faced. Let's take a look at some of the highlights of the 2021-2022 school year. Brianna Ross, a social studies teacher at Deer Park Middle Magnet School, was selected as the 2021-2022 Maryland Teacher of the Year. What an incredible school year this has been. After the ins and outs of the pandemic, it has been just so energizing to be back in the classroom and to be with students. And I, in particular, had a really exciting year representing the exceptional teachers of Baltimore County and the state of Maryland. BCPS County and state leadership 
cut the ribbon for three new school buildings and broke ground for five new BCPS schools and additions. 19 BCPS schools were named winners of the 2021-2022 Baltimore County Clean Green 15 Challenge, receiving more than $24,000 in environmental literacy grants and technology prizes. Melissa Salkeld, a kindergarten teacher at Pretty Boy Elementary School, was selected as the recipient of the 2021-2022 Milken Educator Award. BCPS parents, students, and staff came together for important conversations on school safety and how to work together to cultivate safe and supportive learning environments. Baltimore County Public Schools staff earned several honors from the Maryland School Counselor Association this year, including Maryland School Counselor of the Year, Elementary School Counselor of the Year, Advocate of the Year, and recognition to Towson High School for implementation of a model program. The graduation rate for Baltimore County Public Schools remains steady at 86.2%. The four-year graduation rate improved for Hispanic Latino students in BCPS. The rate rose to 73.3%, a two-year increase of 1.6 percentage points. BCPS students earned 350 awards in Maryland Regional Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Kimberly Culbertson, an assistant principal at Towson High School, was named Assistant Principal of the Year by the Maryland Association of Secondary School Principals. Eastern Technical High School and Western School of Technology and Environmental Science ranked among the top 75 magnet schools in the nation, according to U.S. News and World Report. Brad Fisher, Administrative Secretary at Shady Spring Elementary School, was named 2021-2022 Maryland Education Support Professional of the Year. For the 17th consecutive year, Team BCPS was named one of the best communities for music education. Alicia Amaral Freeman, an ESOL teacher at Franklin Elementary School, was named 2022-2023 Team BCPS Teacher of the Year. What this year has proven is that it's not necessarily the schoolhouse itself and the four walls, but what it means to be back together and building relationships within the four walls. This school year has been a refining one. It has reshaped me as a leader. It has caused me to reimagine what school looks like and how to recoup or rebuild relationships that were lost during the pandemic. As a teacher, I have seen a lot of progress from students from the beginning of the year until now, towards the end of the year. We needed to see them in person so that we could help guide them to become the successful young adults that they will be and that they are now. We celebrate the many accomplishments of Team BCPS and look ahead to the 2022-2023 school year, remaining centered in our core purpose of increase in achievement for all students while preparing a variety of pathways to prepare students for college and careers. I want to thank BCPS TV for that outstanding video. Let's acknowledge them, please. And congratulations to more than 7,200 members of the class of 200, 2022 uh, who reached a milestone in their educational careers. I wish them the best as they navigate their chosen paths successfully. successfully. BCPS, we have a great deal of pride and we want to wish all of them well. And as I said at, at the graduation, we claim you forever. As Team BCPS alumni. There you go. Congratulations to the class of 2022. One more time, let's acknowledge our graduates this year. If we can get, go back to the PowerPoint. Yes, so please join me in celebrating our SROs of the year. We appreciate the incredible support our SROs provide to our school communities. Officer First Class, Craig Willett is based at Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts. Staff and administrators commend him for serving as a community police officer, teacher, mentor, and friend, both during the school day and after, for his personal generosity to students and for his support of our school's wrestling team. Officer Camilla Dukes is assigned to Woodlawn Middle School. 
Woodlawn Middle School staff and administrators describe her as reliable, flexible, and fair. She often participates in restorative circles, mediations, and conflict resolution. She is seen during the school day greeting students, walking through the building, and talking to the students and staff in the cafeteria. And Officer Frank Gillian serves Carol Manor, Hampton, Jacksonville, Lutherville Lab, Mays Chapel, Pandonia, Pinewood, Pot Spring, Pretty Boy, Seven District, Sparks, Timonian, and Warren Elementary Schools. Staff and administrators at these schools praise Officer Gillian for the time he takes to speak to classes about security issues, online behavior, and cyberbullying, participating in gym classes with students, attending school events, participating in school security drills at each school throughout the year. Congratulations to our honorees. Can we acknowledge them, please? <laughs> Next slide, please. Let's honor and celebrate our 2021-2022 retirees for their service and countless contributions to the success of our school system. We appreciate their dedication and wish them the best. Please visit our retiree webpage and take a moment to meet our 2021-2022 retirees. Students, parents, staff, family members, and friends are invited to join hashtag Team BCPS in honoring our retirees by submitting words of congratulations, encouragement, and gratitude on social media or via email to communications at BCPS. Dot org. Congratulations to this year's retirees. Next slide. Our priority is investing in people and progress by addressing critical staffing, hiring and retention issues through increased targeted compensation. Nothing is more important to a student's achievement than having a great teacher, administrator, and supporting staff. Together with the board and our unions, I am committed to retaining our current staff and ensuring BCPS's ability to attract new employees. We will continue working collaboratively with members of Team BCPS to make our school system a place where everyone is valued and feels proud. Next slide. So as we close out this year and look forward to the next one, I would like to forecast some areas of continued focus. As you know, throughout the year, we have worked collaboratively with all union partners and engaged students, staff, parents for feedback. As a result, we have focused on improved communication, climate and morale, and safe and supportive environments. Highlights of these efforts are depicted on this slide. Next slide. Additional areas of intense focus include improved academic performance, reduction of vacancies, and consistent and reliable transportation services. While public school systems across the nation are grappling with these issues, we are committed to tangible improvements in these areas in BCPS. Evidence of these efforts are depicted on this slide. We do not work in isolation. We will continue to work with our partners and stakeholders throughout the summer to provide additional updates on our progress. As the school year comes to a close, I want to recognize that this has been an eventful year and express my appreciation for all the hard work of Team BCPS. I am grateful, grateful for your dedication to our school communities and more importantly, to our students. I hope you enjoy the change of pace summer brings. Please take some time to refresh and relax this summer. We need you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The next item on the agenda is the chair's report. I'll keep my remarks brief. I also want to acknowledge the class of 2022, including our student member of the board, Mr. Christian Thomas. Congratulations, Christian. 
Um, we will certainly miss seeing you on the dais and hope you will not be a stranger. And you will always be a part of the, the board. So thank you. Um, to borrow um, from Principal Karen Steele at George Washington Carver Center to the class of 2022, you not only met the standards of excellence, you defined them. You are a class unlike any other in what you have overcome, you and those that have supported you throughout your journey. Um, the Carver graduation was, was memorable. Their vocal music prime performed um, a song from Dear Evan Hansen, and I'd like to share a lyric in my report. Even when the dark comes crashing through, when you need someone to carry you, when you're broken on the ground, you will be found. BC, in BCPS, there is always someone to pick us up. And the important part is, we, even though when you're down, the important part is getting back up. And I'd like to thank all of those who work so hard to support our students, to keep them standing, but when they fall, to pick them back up. Both our students who pick each other up and our staff who pick each other up and who pick our students up. So thank you for all your hard work this school year. To our students, especially the class of 2022, congratulations. Have a wonderful summer and, and stay in touch. And as Dr. Williams said, you'll always be a part of Team BCPS. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the student board members report. And for that, I call on Mr. Thomas for his last student member report. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, mine will not be as brief since this is my last one. Um, for the last time, good evening, everyone. Today I present to you all my final student member of the board report, and it is quite the bittersweet moment for me, a moment that I never would have imagined coming so quickly. Almost 12 months ago, I was standing in the Towson Courthouse being sworn in wide-eyed and ready to advocate for students, and here I am at the end of my term, older by a year, wiser, but with the same spirit as when we began, the same spirit, spirit of optimism and hope for the students of BCPS, our Board of Education, and our system overall. This past year, I have seen so much incredible work in our school system, from groundbreakings, after ribbon cuttings, after groundbreakings, where I missed a lot of school. We've been celebrating our new construction projects and investing in our students, to presentations in our curriculum committee about the expansion of community schools and increasing course options for students as we move into the next year. I am so excited for the work we've been doing. Watching the astute leadership of our superintendent, Dr. Williams, as he worked to address the concerns of school safety with countless community meetings and piloting school safety assistance programs, to working to improve our transportation in collaboration with this board by providing bonuses and increased funding for our bus drivers. I've enjoyed playing a part in the improvements in our school system and helping to change BCPS with work like the Environmental Sustainability Resolution, the LGBTQ plus Inclusivity Resolution, and our approved calendar that is much more inclusive of our religious diversity in BCPS. And probably the best part and most rewarding thing about this year is getting to visit every single one of our middle and high schools in the county, as well as many of our alternative schools and a number of our elementary schools to connect with students, learn about their concerns, and then being able to bring all of those right up here to the dais and with Dr. Williams. The work we've been doing, the work of our entire system is good work, and I'm so proud of what we've been able to accomplish and the part I played during my term. However, we all know the work is never done. This is why I am so excited that the fiery and passionate individual who will be sitting in my seat to be the next 42nd student member of the board is Roa Hassan. She is the perfect student to continue this work as we enter into a school year filled with inconsistency, as almost this entire Board of Education will be changing, and one in which a more normal year uh, will mean a return from crisis management and into an investment in strategic planning and visionary thinking for all the future for students of BCPS. She will, without a doubt in my mind, be an excellent student member of the board. Good luck next year, Roa. However, before I pass the torch, there are two last messages I have for my colleagues. Number one, thank you. And number two, let's not be insane. Number one, words cannot express how thankful I am for all of you on the board. You have put yourself in a position that has heightened public scrutiny and are constantly in divisive situations. But yet you're here every day every board meeting supporting our students. Thank you, Ms. Hen, Mr. McMillian, and Ms. Scott 
for serving as board leadership, uh, the chairs and vice chairs during my term. Thank you to Ms. Causey and former board member Ms. Pastor for partnering, me, partnering with me and leading the legislative committee. Thank you to Ms. Mack for your leadership in the curriculum committee. Thank you, Ms. Rowe, although we're not here right now, for your leadership in PRC. And a huge thank you to Dr. Hager, Ms. Joes, Ms. Rowe again, and Ms. Scott for the excellent work we're doing in the equity committee, as well as any former equity committee members. Thank you to Dr. Williams for your steadfast leadership this year and your willingness to always listen and respond to student concerns. Thank you to our staff, especially Dr. McComas and everyone working in the Division of School Curriculum and Instruction. Dr. Yarvro and Dr. Zarchin, thank you for the work you're doing for school safety. Ms. Charlie Green for the support you've given with improving communications in BCPS. Mr. Hartlove for your new, well, I guess it's not really new anymore, work with the budgets. And Ms. Anderson for your recruitment efforts to retain staff and support our students. And Mr. Augusto, and I know Mr. Corns isn't here, uh, for your work with IT and supporting our school system with that. Now for number two. As many of you probably know, Albert Einstein's definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Well, board members, I feel that we might be verging on the verging into insanity if we fail to approve the My View Literacy contract tonight. If this contract fails, we'd be insane because our data is showing that the nine year old Mod Pod Hodgepodge Frankenstein curriculum that is currently in place needs a massive change. Our data shows that we need that change now. We needed it years ago, especially now, though. We're insane. If we pretend to be concerned about test scores, student achievement, and data, and then are not actually willing to take the steps to change the root of that problem, which is our curriculum. We are insane if we claim to be moving towards academic excellence by defying the advocacy of our teachers in our pilot schools, ignoring the science of evidence-based reading, and leaving our children with anything less than what is this literacy curriculum. You and I, we are insane if we claim to be focusing on increasing student literacy while refusing to take the step to give our teachers the flexible, easily modifiable, and 21st century tools that is within this curriculum to teach our children. We are insane if we don't change our curriculum and follow what our educational professionals, individuals who have dedicated their entire lives to education and curriculum, those individuals that are pushing for this. But board members, I hope that we will be verging on the edge of sanity tonight and adopt this contract to equip our students and staff with physical books, online options, mentor text, an all-encompassing plan for professional development, rigorous texts in which students are pushed and they have been pushed in our pilot schools where I got to experience uh, seeing students with IEPs succeeding in ways they had not in previous years and improving tremendously. Because the insane route is continuing to look at our data, the achievement of our students, and continuing to use the same in curriculum, the same curriculum. But I think we're all seeing individuals, so I hope we won't do that. It has been an honor representing 111,000 students on the board this year. I will forever be thankful for our school system, the teachers, bus drivers, principals, cafeteria workers, and the work of our superintendent and board that is doing to continue to make our schools excellent places and made them excellent places for my educational journey in BCPS. And lastly, a huge thank you to my family. Thank you for standing by my side after these ridiculously long board meetings where I sometimes left in tears because of the passion I have for our students. Thank you for listening to me as I complain about these people who might be considered insane, depending on tonight's contract vote. And thank you for always supporting me every step of the way to this Board of Education and for all the support you'll give me on all the future endeavors. Board members, it has been a pleasure this past year, and I really hope that we can continue to do great work for our students. I'll be back. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, before I go, I just wanted to show this book to you all real quick. It's the My View Literacy book. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Mercedes. Good evening. As you know, earlier tonight you met in closed session in your quasi-judicial capacity to render decisions in six appeals. Those were numbers HE 22-19, HE 22-23, 
HE 22-24, HE 22-25, HE 22-27, and SD 2021-22-03. Now would be an appropriate time to confirm the votes taken in closed session. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's cases HE 2219, 2223, 2224, 2225, 2227, and SD 2021, 2203, and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present? So moved, Matt. Is there a second? Second, Thomas. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Causey? Thank you. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Persades. The next item on the agenda is contract awards. Do we have Ms. Joes? Yes, I'm here, Ms. Oh, she's Ms. Joes, hi. Um, for that, I call on Ms. Joes, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Good evening. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Members of the board, the board's Building and Contract Committee met on Monday, June 13, 2022. Items M1 through M40 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Ms. Jones, may we separate item M2? Yes. Okay. Um, they're all coming approved from the committee, so I can make two motions. M1, M3 to M40 is being brought to the board for full approval. Okay, thank you. Do I have a motion to approve items M1 and M3 through M40? So moved, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion, board members? Mr. Thomas? Yes, thank you, Ms. Hunt. Ms. Claus, you had something in the chat. You need to separate other items out. Ms. Causey, which, which items would you like to separate? Thank you, um, Mr. Thomas. So the construction contracts and the, let's see, item two. Item no, two is, is already that? separated. M29 through M39? Yes. Okay, so there's already a motion on the floor, um, I will with, withdraw my, well, actually Mr. Offerman made the motion, if he's willing to withdraw that. No second yes. was needed. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Um, do I have a motion to approve items M1 and M3 through, bear with me one moment, please, M28. So moved. Thank you, Offerman. Mr. Offerman. No seconds needed. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, Ms. Gover? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Um, and we can have discussion. Do I have a motion to, Ms. Cozzi, do you need to separate each construction contract out or may we can process them as uh, they they're can part be of the same together. package? I'm going, to, I'm going to abstain from them, so they can be all together. Okay, so let's process those and, and get that out of the way. Um, do I have thank a motion? You. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve items M29 through M39? So moved, Offerman. Thank you. No seconds needed. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? 
Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Um, we will return to um, M2. Do I have a motion to approve item M40, the EFMP? So moved, Thomas. No seconds needed. Any discussion? May I have a roll call, oh, Ms. Mack? Yes, thank you very much, um, Ms. Hen. Um, as has been stated uh, many times tonight, uh, referenced many times tonight, 2019 pre pandemic, only 37.3% of Mac, our. We're discussing M40, the Educational Facilities Master Plan I, and Comprehensive I'm so Plan. So sorry. No worries. Any questions on M40, board members? Okay. Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. The motion carries. M40 is approved. Um, we're now, do I have a motion to approve item M2? So move, Thomas. No seconds needed. Any discussion? Ms. Mack? As has been referenced by many tonight, in 2019 pre-pandemic, only 37% of our third graders demonstrated proficiency in reading, while only 33% of our 10th graders de demonstrated proficiency. During that same pre-pandemic period, only 38% of our third graders demonstrated proficiency with math in math, and 17% of students demonstrated proficiency in algebra. The stated proficiencies levels represent a significant and sustained decline in academic achievement over the last six years in spite of the fact that during that same period, the Board of Education approved 24 ELA contracts with a spending authority of $59,422,000 and 20 math contracts with a spending authority exceeding $42 million. This six-year spending authority of over $102 million was for curriculum, interventions, and games only and did not include any pandemic dollars. If approving this contract could solve our sustained and significant lack of academic achievement, I would be voting for it, but our problems are bigger than that. For example, we don't even know who has been trained on the last 12 ELA pro products we have purchased even though the cost of those products is in the multi thousand of dollars. So I guess that makes me insane. I will not be voting for it. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Thank you, Ms. Hen. Ashley has some questions, but having heard uh, so much data, I would actually like Dr. McComas, who is an expert, this is your life's work, Dr. Williams, Dr. Yarbrough, Ms. Shea. In very simple word, third grade level, come and rebut that because this is what you guys do and what she said is totally wrong. Yeah. Uh, so I want you to rebut it because it doesn't matter. They're not going to vote for it, but it has to be rebutted because it's false. So good evening, uh, Chair Hen and members of the board and Dr. Williams. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so first I will begin by saying that our data is unacceptable, absolutely. No one at this table believes that our data is acceptable, which is why we are bringing forward the very best evidence-based product that we have used our proper procedures to identify. Part of our struggle is that our curriculum requires an extensive amount of customization by our teachers, which is part of why our teachers are um, tired from the workload on the heels of our pandemic, where we had to ask them two and three times to adjust what they were doing. This curriculum brings forward a very cohesive, easy to use product. I will ask uh, Ms. Shea and then Ms. Kraft if they'd like to join um, in my comment. But I will tell you that part of our struggle is that right now what we have in place, and if we choose to keep that, we are choosing to ask our teachers to continue to work more um, extensively. No one thinks that our, our data is acceptable, least of all me. 
And every one of those contracts that I have brought forward has been to target interventions for students that are identified for very specific learning needs. It has been brought forward to, to really address the needs of our students. And we have, as I have said previously at this table, we have just this year been putting in place a professional development database whereby we will be able to have that data for you because we too want that data. As everyone knows, we have a large faculty. We have approximately 9,000 teachers to train. And we know that we are in a staffing changeover as many people are leaving the profession either for retirement or other opportunities. And so our training needs never stop. We will never hit a day where everyone is trained 100% because of the natural attrition rate of the profession. So I just want to clarify that. And at this point, I'll invite Ms. Shea if you want to add. Sure. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Um, I would just add that in those nine years, we have not replaced the foundation, the core curriculum, which is what we're doing. We have brought forward many resources. We have targeted those resources to specific learning needs, whether it's part of our multi-tiered system of support for students have specific reading disabilities, supporting students receiving special education, providing classroom libraries, et cetera. What we are bringing forward tonight is replacing a nine-year-old core curriculum for language comprehension that does not meet high quality standards. And so as Dr. McComas shared, what we've been trying to do over nine years that has not yielded the change for students has been to piecemeal add different pieces and address one component at a time. What the research tells us more than ever is that the core curricular instructional materials are an extremely important part of the science of reading and of how you move student achievement. It's why it's written into Comar legislation requiring that we have a standards aligned core curriculum. It's why it's a part of the Maryland Leeds grant funding sources because it's necessary. That research has come a tremendous way. Organizations like Ed Reports did not exist when we brought forward many of the other resources Ms. Mack has described. And so what I would also add is that there is no perfect curriculum. I listened really carefully to every teacher that I talked to, and as Ms. Sexton described, I respond. I will leave no teacher behind when we adopt this. I will work with teachers to support them in their needs. I guarantee there are some students for whom these texts are too hard. Part of our challenge is that we have not been using text that matches the complexity of our state curriculum, our standards, and our assessments. So it does feel hard, but we're going to scaffold and we're going to keep those high expectations for our students because they deserve it. We need both. It's not an either or. We do need contracts for resources to support specific learning disabilities. We need professional learning in a variety of different strategies, including Orton Gillingham and letters training. And we need a solid foundation core program in every classroom for every child every day. And that's what we're bringing forward today. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Yes, thank you for that um, for that information. And um, I, I agree that is the definition of insanity, as you said, doing the same thing over and again and over and again, and expecting a different result. So, um, with that being said, um, you just said that um, the curriculum it hasn't changed in nine years. So that's almost ten years. Correct. Okay. And um, also, so it's showing that what we're doing or what we have been doing isn't working. So I'm not sure why we would want to continue doing that. That's that's bizarre to me. That doesn't logically make sense. And the fact that board members, especially those who are on our curriculum, are thinking that that's acceptable and it's okay is 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 just as a fellow board member a little bit alarming. Um, I don't know why you would stay on the course or why we would want to stay on the course of something that's not working, that's been proven not to work, and this is something that can work and can help, and we're not, or there are people who are not wanting to do that. Um, uh, so I just had a, a question. Was this funding, um, would this have come out of the bat? Okay, so by that not getting funded, then this funding, th this contract is also in jeopardy because it, so thank you, Ms. Scott, for that. So yes, we have requested funding for this in the bat. What that would allow us to do is to do K to five all at once. As all of you recall, when we transitioned 
uh, the math curriculum, which we're asking to do the same thing tonight for English language arts at the elementary school. When we transitioned for math, we were not able to do that in a single sweep, nor were we able to do open court in a single sweep. And so the BAT provides us that opportunity so that we don't have our third, fourth, and fifth graders or a K-1-2 having to wait two, three, four years to get that opportunity. Time is urgent. Mm -hmm. We all know that we are coming out of two years of a great deal of interrupted learning. And so to be able to do that in one sweep would be fantastic for our children. Our contingency plan is that if, it, if, if we don't get the bat, um, then I would use my own operating budget to begin a phase rollout. We could extend the pilot um, for a longer period of time, um, but we need to move forward, rather that's in a whole sweep K to, K to five or in a different format. But what we cannot do is stand still. What we cannot do is stay where we are for our children or our teachers. And is learning something new work? Yes. Well, it yeah, is. you're answering my, my questions because that was what I was going to ask, what you, you were going to do and how you're going to roll it out. And then you answer that. Um, is diversity in learning, does that help children learn better? Absolutely. The research is really clear. That I would assume it does, absolutely. but you all are the experts. <laughs> Yes, and, and I certainly would also invite Ms. Kraft. The, the research is clear that culturally relevant pedagogy as well as diverse text and students being able to see themselves is critical to student achievement. It's not an either or, it's both. Yeah. We have to be sure our students see themselves in the text. We also have to make sure that culturally re relevant pedagogy includes high expectation. These texts are carefully lexiled, so when we talk about them being challenging, part of that is reflecting that we have not been meeting the text complexity required, which is also evident in our state assessment data. Um, having students have an opportunity to read from diverse authors, from diverse time periods, making connections interdisciplinary is all a part of the science of reading. Sometimes we only talk about science of reading to mean phonics, mm -hmm. and it is so much more than that. Mm -hmm. And it talks specifically about making those background knowledge and content knowledge connections through language comprehension. Okay, and so, and so I mean, this is great news. This is wonderful to hear. And so by not updating this, it sounds like we're holding our children back by not doing that. We're, in other districts and other areas, children are getting advanced curriculum and, and learning the latest. And we as a board, by not approving this, are literally holding our children back by almost 10 years. And for me, that's unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you. And, Thank and you. Ms. Scott, just to uh, clarify, the, do the dollars for uh, this were in the original bat and in the revised bat tonight that's brought forward it's also in that so so you know our hope is that that will be passed here tonight and and passed by the, the council going forward yes thank you mrs causey good evening um thank you <clears throat> excuse me thank you for this discussion i know that we all have the uh, best interests and uh, sometimes different opinions it's okay to have them um during a CNI meeting, an ELA audit was referenced. Who is conducting the audit? How much did it cost? When did the audit start? When is it expected to be concluded? Why would CNI bring a multi-million dollar, multi-year contract before seeing the final audit recommendations as was done with the math curriculum? Great question, Ms. Causey. So I'm happy to say, as I have informed the board over the years, but I know we've had many things going on, MSDE is conducting, uh, was began an audit for us. They began the audit in February of 2020. And we know what the happened to the world in March of 2020. When school began in the fall of 2020, MSDE met with us again uh, to begin that work. They did not complete that audit in the 2021 2020-2021 school year. Um, they didn't complete it. I don't know if it was because we experienced a ransomware, but nevertheless, at the end of the year, they had not completed it. They met with us again this year to begin that audit. Uh, once again, they have not completed the audit. They are in the process of going through a significant changes at MSDE this year. Um, at, to include uh, staff that were involved with the audit. We are bringing this forward because we already know that the curriculum that we have does not meet the COMAR standards. Uh, 
We don't need to wait for some outside agency to tell us what we already know, which is what we have is not meeting the expectation. And air data is evidence to that fact. Um, and so we could wait, we could kick this can, but it will only hurt our children. Can I add something? Um, yes, the other thing the that I wanted to add, Ms. To oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Ms. Shea. Sure. Um, what I also wanted to add is in Comar, it talks about either having the um, external partners such as Ed Reports or having MSDE conduct the audit. Part of the reason MSDE had selected our LEA to begin that work is because the wonders material does not meet standards according to Ed Reports. So they already started that process originally selecting us from all 24 LEAs because they already had evidence that the current core resource, which is the Wonders Anthology, does not meet the evidence-based standards. So I just think that underscores Dr. McComas' um, direction that we're not being premature, we're trying to be proactive because our students deserve that. Um, and, and, and I just wanted to share that piece of how we even were identified for the MSDE audit, which has not taken place. Yes, and just to clarify, it, it, there's no cost to us for MSDE to do that audit. Um, and again, we um, look forward to when they complete the audit, but what we already know, that we don't need to wait for them to tell us what we know. Okay, thank you. My next question is, um, the bat that's now attached in board docs um, shows 6.6 .6 million for my view, and the previous bat that was denied by the county council showed 7.9 million. So why is the contract present it here uh, for 10 million. I, I, it, it's fully covered and I believe it's because we're going to pick up some of that um, through, in, in order to kind of uh, address the, count, the council's concerns, um, we, we uh, shifted some of those funds, uh, some of the funding to next year. So it's gonna be a combination of year end funding um, and then the rest of it will be done with uh, uh, FY23 funding. Can I also? Okay, add sure, sure, sure. Um, and then I, I just also want to add because this just did come up in the contracts committee. Um, some of the funding identified in the spending authority is for the duration of the five year contract. And so we will use um, different funding moving forward to replenish consumables. As Mr. Thomas held up the consumable that our students and teachers have given us really positive feedback on. So that would not be in the BAT because that would be this year's purchase to ensure teachers had their teacher materials and students had materials. And then some of the $10 million spending authority is to ensure that in years two through five, we're able to continue to purchase those replenishment of consumables for schools. Okay, thank you. Sure. And, um, you know, I have to say I've been on the board for seven years and many, many times I've heard urgent, um, you know, uh, discussion around purchases and then some of which were not used two years later were not used or some years later were found to not be effective so it's it's concerning that it's only a four-week pilot um <clears throat> and the other question i had is what other districts in maryland are using this um, so I can share other districts nationwide. I don't know, Ms. Kraft, if we have any other districts in Maryland, um, but I can uh, start with the other districts nationally that have shared our data. The other thing I would just like to add, though, um, although the pilot is shorter than we would like because of circumstances that we're all well aware of, um, we are building upon a highly evidenced research base from Ed Reports. So the pilot is around us test driving within BCPS. How does it integrate in Schoology, for example? How are students accessing it through our learning management system and in focus? We already have not only the Ed Reports National Organization, but multiple states that have given it the highest rating. So in some of our other programs, as you have identified, we don't have that foundation of research to build upon, and we're much more reliant on the data that we have. This time is different. We're building upon a much more solid foundation of research. Um, in terms of the districts um, in other states that have used this, uh, we have multiple states that have including, I'm gonna pull up, um, but while I'm doing that, Ms. Kraft, are there any other state uh, districts within Maryland that are using it? So right now there are not any other districts in Maryland, which is why we went back to the company to find the districts across the United States that are using them. And we were able to find um, uh, a lot of uh, states that are using it. And we, they also were able to pull together a graphic um, of states that started the adoption 
um, when it was published in 2020. And so they were able to show the year end um, data for 2019, and then they were able to come back and show um, the year end results of 21. And so uh, what Ms. Shea is about to talk about is the data that we saw in states that have implemented it over a period of time, and we were able to see some measurable growth and in some of these states that Ms. Shea will talk about, like Texas had 121 um, schools uh, within that district that were using the product. And in Texas, they saw 7% growth. In Pennsylvania, they saw 12.5% growth in the pandemic year, in the year where we had multiple disruptions. Idaho saw 13.7% growth, Michigan 3%, Louisiana 7.27%. Massachusetts 5%, North Carolina 1%, and Georgia 7.2%. The other thing that I will offer too is in addition to Ed reports I mentioned, there are several states that did their own curricular review. I believe Ms. Hen cited the one from Massachusetts, which is very thorough, and they gave it the highest rating. And while they certainly identified that it isn't perfect, each of the states that did their own investigation of my view literacy gave it that highest rating. So uh, again, I share that while our internal pilot was brief and we wish it would have been longer, but with other disruptions to this year, that wasn't possible. Um, we believe it gave us a story of how it integrates into Schoology. Our teachers were very vocal. They shared with us what we need to do to support them with professional learning. They identified which resources were the most beneficial. And they also told us what was a challenge. Um, there is no perfect curriculum. And one thing that I just wanna underscore is even if I came back in year 10 or year 11, I would not be able to bring you a curriculum that 100% of everyone everywhere thought was perfect. It doesn't exist. Instead, what I'm trying to do is bring forward a curriculum that I know is based on evidence, aligns to the science of reading, meets the Comar requirements, and provides our students with the opportunities and our teachers with what they deserve as a foundation. It's what we need. I'll, I'll reserve my time. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question. It's not comment. Sorry. Um, can you elaborate on the LEADS grant and the requirement that is set forth in the LEADS grant? And if this contract wasn't approved, would we be able to qualify for that? Sure. And um, Ms. Kraft can certainly chime in as well. So as you know, in the Maryland's gr LEADS grant, there were seven different strategies that systems could apply for funding under, one of which was the science of reading. We applied for the science of reading specifically to address some of what Ms. Mack raised, which is to ensure we had funding to train our teachers in high evidence-based training, such as Orton, Gillingham, and Letters. Mm -hmm. In order to qualify and apply for the science of reading, there were three sub-strategies. Districts had to either show evidence that they already met that strategy or demonstrate how they would use the LEADS funding for that strategy. The three strategies within the science of reading were professional learning, which is what we applied for, an assessment system, which we already have in place using the Dibble system to meet the Ready to Read Act. And the third was a high quality instructional material that was evidence-based. When we met with staff from MSDE to get feedback on our application for the Maryland LEADS grant around the science of reading, the only question that they asked us was, what is your plan to ensure you have a high quality evidence-based curriculum as your instructional material in elementary school? We shared with them this plan. We shared with them that we were taking it to the curriculum committee, that we had a pilot in place, and we shared that we had chosen My View Literacy and the Ed Reports Foundation. I believe that if we are not able to move forward, we would not be in alignment with that expectation of the strategy within the Maryland LEADS grant funding because it was very clearly stipulated and it was the only question that they asked us when they met to give us feedback on our application. How much money is the Maryland LEADS grant? 11.9 million. Okay, thank you. Um, when I visited the two schools that I visited, I think it was Honeywell Elementary School and West Tuscan Elementary School, um, Ms. Kraft and I heard from staff and teachers there, they were really advocating for this curriculum. They were also sharing some student stories, some student success stories, some of the things that st student response really, and as the student member of the board, that's what I, I really care about most. So can you share some of your uh, responses that you've heard from students? Actually, I would love to um, share, if I may, uh, an email we got from a teacher today. She actually sent it yesterday, but it was forwarded to us today. I wanted to share a beautiful moment with you and the connections my class made as we read a book for pleasure outside today. I read the book Ron's Mission to my class. It's about a young African-American boy in the late 1950s who goes to the public library to make a stand. He wanted to stand for equality and the ability to check out his own library books because that was against the law in South Carolina at the time. 
As soon as I read the page about him not being able to check out his own books, the entire class began making connections to the unit Changing Laws, Changing Lives, the Martin Luther King Jr. story we had read through this pilot. The students talked about unfairness, racism, how this law was similar to ones they had read about within segregation and the text that they read that challenged them and how people could have helped Ron. On the back of our book, there was a little blurb and a picture of Ron McNair, who was a real person and ended up becoming an astronaut. The text mentioned that the story was a fictionalized story of real events. Because of the foundational knowledge of the pilot built with fiction stories and how they can have real stories and real events at the basis, our students understood that it was a real story and a real event, but only some of the details may have been changed. This was a cool experience and it occurred completely organically as my class led the discussions and made the majority of the connections. I can't say enough about the pilot and the engagement and lasting impact it has had on my students. Signed, a kindergarten teacher. This was kindergarten. In fifth grade, when we visited Honeygo Elementary, this, the teacher was incredibly passionate when she met with us at the she end. Was. And what she shared with us was that the level of discourse that was happening in the class, the level of stamina her students were demonstrating, and the level of writing was not taking place in her class three months ago. She is a veteran teacher who is a rock star. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what she shared at the end was that in that class of students that we saw engaging with an incredibly complex text, about the cycles of nature, eventually going to read about forest fires and controlled fires, 10 of the students in the class that we had observed were students currently receiving services through an individual education plan or receiving special education services. And so those are just two stories at two ends of the spectrum from kindergarten and fifth grade that underscore how potentially powerful this could be for our students and teachers. And I sat at the table with those students, looking at the text with them, and I was just blown away. I mean, some of those concepts in the reading, I learned about in AP environmental science, like in my sophomore year of high school. They were so complex, they were so engaging, and the connections they were making between their lives and their environment, I, I was blown away. Um, can you talk about why this curriculum was chosen over other curriculums that you may have been considering? Sure, Ms. Kraft, do you want to talk a little bit about our 6002 process? Sure, so we uh, followed the 6002 process to make sure that we were uh, using our own policies and guidelines and we actually started this in 2020 and this has been a very extensive process. And so what happens is we issue an RFI um, and then publishers send in materials and we do an, uh, a first review to see did they meet the requirements of the RFI. Um, and so what happens at that point is we weed out anyone that didn't meet the basic requirements of what we asked for. Um, from there, uh, we then did a stakeholder review uh, where we had the curricular um, materials plus um, actually the vendors come out and present the materials um, once we had narrowed down to three that had really emerged that they had met all of our requirements. Um, and at that point, we were like, we could pilot any of these. These, you know, these all met the minimum requirement. What happened in that vendor presentation was this one is the one that emerged yeah. as the highest um, in terms of all of our stakeholders. And so we had parents, we had uh, um, people from dyslexia um, come, you know, um, a, a decoding um, come out and be in our. Um, group, we had administrators, we had teachers, we had reading specialists, um, a really uh, large gamut of people that examined all of them. Um, and so then we got down to my view and that was the one that emerged as being the strongest. And as we looked at the other curricula, we had some concerns. Um, one, I, you know, we looked at, did it really meet our minimum requirement for equity? Um, and then there was another one that we really were looking at the rigor of the standards and did it really fully embrace the rigor of the standards. And so that's when we moved forward with my view um, in the schools. And so we really, it, but it was over the course of 18 months that this was not taken lightly. We, you know, every step of the way we followed the policy and we made sure that stakeholders were involved every step of the way um, to ensure and even um, Emma Shea shared uh, two very lovely stories, but even um, we were at a different school and we were in a third grade classroom and we just basically said to the students, how do you like this compared to what you were doing before? And they were like, we love it. Don't make us use the orange books again. Is that the orange? Is that what it was? Like? Don't let us use the orange books. So, you know, it is really interesting as you start to think about all those stakeholders and, you know, what they're saying. And so, um, so that's a little bit of the process. I mean, it's obviously a very long process, but that's how we ended up with my view was really through the stakeholder um, input. 
And if I can add too, because I think this is important, um, and we are working to make this process even more transparent. Um, the teachers that were participating, we asked our TABCO um, leadership to help us identify. Um, one of the teachers, I will tell you, has since retired, but she is one who, for the five years I've been in this position, begged me to replace <laughs> the curriculum every year. I'm sorry that she retired before I was able to. Um, but I just share that because sometimes teachers say, um, did you handpick teachers or how can I participate in that process? And we, um, we do want to, move moving forward, make it even more transparent, but I wanted to share for the record, um, we asked our advisory groups, such as CCAC, as Ms. Kraft mentioned, we asked TABCO and CASE to provide us with um, representatives to represent the teachers and the administrators. I think that's important for people to understand how those individuals participated. Thank you. And I just want to echo that. This was an 18-month process, not just the four weeks in the pilot. There was so much more behind that. So thank you so much for sharing that. I'll reserve the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up to Mr. Thomas's question and then a comment. So it's really helpful to hear about the process. And he touches on, and you've shared with me information that ties into the questions I was going to ask, which okay. are centered around process, because right. my concerns are not so much the product, but rather the process that we followed and that we're doing our due diligence to make sure that we are getting the bang for our, mm -hmm. our taxpayers' bucks, yes, because they are the ones investing in this. And as others have said, We've invested considerably in resources, and we want to see the return on that investment for our students, as I know you do too. Of course. Um, our, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Montgomery County's CNI um, website, but their process is extremely transparent. Mm -hmm. They have um, thorough information on their site. Sorry, Dr. Williams, not to bring up MCPS, but um, it and it. It outlines exactly their process, their pilot. I believe they spent 18 months um, changing ALA curriculums, yes. but or their curriculum. And you know, our pilot was a, a few weeks. And I know, Michelle, you you expressed the concern in that. Um, however, transparency goes a long way sure. in that. So, um, if you could respond to that concern with regards to the pilot, yep. again, they they discussed they piloted in 12 schools for 18 months. Um, how does this board know that we've done our due diligence and why should we support this given the, the differences in, in those two pilots? Because that's a very different process. I, I, think, I think it's a really good question. What I would also offer, and certainly um, in this instance, I'm lucky that I have Ms. Kraft as an expert because she actually was a part of Montgomery County when we actually um, were able to bring her here and we're lucky to have her expertise. So she may be able to talk a little bit about their process since I cannot. What I can offer is that the 18 months that we went through our process is absolutely in alignment with our board policy and rule in 6002. Um, in that board policy, it is very specific about the ways that we do our RFI. We work together with our purchasing office, and Ms. Webster will, um, I'm sure, is nodding because she knows this has been a lot of work to strengthen this process, as well as to ensure that we are documenting that process. The, um, the other piece that I want to um, talk about is that the time period was impacted through COVID. Our goal originally had been to pilot this entire school year, um, actually beginning last year, because when we first engaged in the RFI process and, and selecting the material, that was our preparation plan. What we found when we engaged with schools was that there were so many other things on schools' plates in terms of changes that were happening with reopening, trying to understand scheduling, responding to learning acceleration, ensuring our students had what they need and centering them. It also was impacted in our office support. You've heard many tales tonight, even Case spoke to. Central office was out in schools. We've been substituting. We've been mm -hmm. teaching in classes, helping to support that staff shortage. So we did not have the capacity throughout the entire year to support a pilot the way that we intended. So there were multiple factors that impacted the last piece of our process. Um, but the entirety of the process, no shortcuts were taken in terms of the RFI, in terms of the reviewing of the um, different products, and in terms of stakeholders having an opportunity. We had it on public display. We had multiple meetings with our different union partners, as well as um, some of the advisory boards that participated. The, the part that was not as lengthy was the actual using in the classroom. And again, I say, in the past, uh, we have not had the foundation of those research bases. Um, in terms of transparency, we agree. I get a lot of emails and questions asking about the process. Um, I work very closely with the TABCO Curriculum and Instruction Committee. They've been helping me to develop ways to get the word out there. Dr. McComas and I actually have been working on a website redesign around transparency around all aspects of curriculum because we know that that's something our parents are very invested in. We want our parents as partners. 
Um, and so we do have a, a significant intention to shift what we're forward facing, what you can actually learn just from the public facing website, not only about the process of how we choose curriculum, but even about what curriculum is in place and how people can learn about how to help their child at home. Um, so all of that is a part of our work because we agree, transparency is key to building trust, to helping parents know how they can support their student. Um, and so to date, we've really relied on our partners in the unions to help us with sending that message out, but we have talked about plans moving forward for how we can utilize some of our other communication tools. I know our communications office is working um, around website design in general, and we wanna be a part of that as well. Sure, and, and I appreciate your candor, and you know this is a conversation, right? Sure. So it's certainly not meant to say, but they're doing this and, and compare us because continual improvement is what it's about. Yeah. Um, and I'm sharing that feedback with you because I think as the board looks to under, better understand your process and we want to approve things that you recommend to us, that would help us in the confidence we need to say, yeah, this is the transparency we're looking for, this is what our stakeholders are looking for. But you, you mentioned that um, in the classroom is one area that time, we did not invest that time. And I would say that that is the most important step in our process, is that time, the time spent in the classroom. Well, well I would say, using I the product. say we didn't go as long as I wanted, but we did invest, we, we started this pilot in the classrooms for the entirety of the fourth marking period. And they did teach an entire unit within that pilot. Right, so I did just want to thank you, Michelle. I did want to add that um, we actually did pilot for eight weeks. Uh, a unit of instruction is actually only six weeks long, but we knew it was new and people would need kind of an on-ramp and to learn it. And so they did um, do an entire unit from start to finish so that they could see every aspect of it. And so while the units are usually only slated for six weeks, we ran the pilot for eight weeks to give a little bit of buffer time as we were learning it. So. Um, in that sense, I do feel good that in every single grade, we piloted at least one unit to see um, how the teachers responded, how the students responded, um, what kind of engagement there was, uh, not only for teachers, but for students, um, and then just all the pieces um, that go with it. And so in that sense, I can say that, you know, we did get a chance to see a unit from start to finish. And, and then I would also add, if I may, we have already had conversations with our teachers union. Um, we did something very similar with Open Court and with Bridges where when it was the first year of full implementation, our teachers that were using the curriculum used a modified evaluation tool that we used during pilots so that um, there's an aspect of the evaluation where teachers are not impacted in terms of their teacher evaluation based on learning new materials. So that's a process that's already been in place. Um, and we had already talked about um, with TAPCO doing that just like we had done for Bridges and Open Court when it was our first year of full implementation. Yet we have Montgomery County piloting for 18 months it's versus time. ours eight weeks. Yes, yes, I understand it's time. So, um, so let me Dr. let Williams. me respond because um, um, we always. Okay. I just want to respond. Williams. I apologize. I didn't know you all were. No, I apologize. Um, I just want to respond. In 2019, we had this board had concerns with our data. We all had concerns with our data. We spent eight months updating this MAC, our strategic plan, to be very critical about data points we want to see before our students reach a certain grade level. We did that hard work. And when I talk to the team, it is three components, the written, taught, and assessed curriculum. Our data was not strong based on one data point. One data point, which was the state assessment, which changed multiple years. So if the experts in the room said we have to look at the written curriculum and taught curriculum. That's what this team has done. If you're gonna to continue to mention data points and say Dr. Williams and team, fix the data point, we have to look at everything related to what the data, how we generate the data. We don't fix students. We don't fix students. Students come as they are, we love them, we teach them. We look at ourselves as adults, that's school improvement. We look at the resources that we provide our staff. This board supported Baltimore County Public Schools over years by buying the resources needed for students. If we're not getting the results, 
And if you keep mentioning data points, we have to look at how do we improve these data points. The team has gone forth and looked at the written curricula, which was not evidence-based. Let's look at the written curricula. We did the same thing with the mathematics. This board supported us with contracts, building that pipeline. So all those students that graduate, 7,200 students graduated, we back my, mapped them and looked at their success to look at grades in which we want to monitor their progress. So the written curriculum is being discussed. If it's not working, we need to look at a different menu, a different support different resource in the written. What the team also said, and I don't want this just to go through one ear and out the other, is the taught curriculum. That's the school side and the curriculum going in classrooms and providing feedback to our staff. We put forth the revised teaching and learning. I put forth the revised teaching and learning framework. That's how we assess how our, our staff members are doing, Ms. Matt, with observations and providing feedback. And the last piece is the assess. We can't wait for a state assessment to determine how our students are doing. We came to this board and say, we would like to provide this tool to our administrators so they can have on-time data instead of lagging data, Ms. Hen, which would be the state assessments. This board funded that, and that's a game changer. So staff and students have data immediately to then inform how they're going to reteach or accelerate or provide interventions. So when you mention a data point in 2019, I'm familiar with that. I looked at all the data. The charge is how do we move this system around instruction? It's the written, as Ms. Shea said, you're not going to find a perfect curriculum. We found a much better curriculum. But it's the written, taught, and assessed curriculum to prepare our students for kindergarten, second grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, and tenth grade. I will ask the board to go back and look at the strategic plan that talks about those grade points. So 2019 happened. We can't argue that. That's a data point. That, therefore, we say to the system and system leaders, you have to look at multiple data points to understand how our students are doing, and then to intervene. So what the team is suggesting, that it is time to revamp our curriculum if you're expecting and holding us accountable to get better results. But I'm going to just end and say it again. It's the written taught and assess curriculum. And if we can't do one of those focus areas, it's going to take us a much longer time to improve the instruction. And as it was said earlier, we don't have that. We don't have time. There's a sense of urgency. There's a sense of urgency, particularly in what we encountered with the pandemic and potential learning loss um, among our most vulnerable students. So I ask that you have an open mind, a part of the board principles. I will listen with an open mind and demonstrate flexibility and creativity in seeking solutions. We have come forth with an opportunity to provide a solution that will help many of our kids who are not reading and writing at grade level. And since you mentioned Montgomery County Public Schools, that's a whole different system. And that process, if I believe, Ms. Kraft, was pre-pandemic. It was. Thank and, you. And it wasn't a full 18-month um, you know, um, pilot. And yeah. pilots mean different things. Like, so sometimes a pilot is like, we're just trying it out, but we haven't purchased anything. And sometimes people call year one when they've already purchased the materials a pilot. And so sometimes different language is used for different means. Yeah. So what the team is coming forth to, to encourage the board, if we want to see outcomes, I'm committed and I have involved the entire central office. We follow our strategic plan. But when it comes to C and I, they've heard me say many times, the written, taught, and assessed curriculum 
And that's what we're putting forth tonight, particularly in our English language arts. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mack, you are next. Will our LEADS grant be at risk because we have $11 million of spending authority on two products that do not meet the stand, do, are rated as do not meet on Ed reports? I'm not sure I understand your question. LLI and Fontas and Pinnell are, um, does not meet. No, Will that impact our ability to get the LEADS grant? No, neither LLI or Fontas and Pinnell are the core ELA curriculum. The specific strategy in the Maryland LEADS grant speaks to the core ELA curriculum being a high quality instructional material as evidence based. And then my comment is for everybody who loved this, in 2017, teachers and students loved a math program that we ultimately paid $3.2 million for and did not get rid of it until we paid $650,000 to have an audit tell us that it did not help outcomes. No comment? Okay. Dr. Hager? I'm uh, sorry, I, I tend to lose my poker face when I get tired. <laughs> so, um, I want to start by saying I, I'm glad this is evidence-based. The, the process, the bulk of the time we spent on this was finding and identifying an evidence-based curriculum. And it's the core curriculum, so it's super important. So I thank you for, for identifying that. My concern is, of course, with the implementation. There's a whole field of implementation science that says, you know, you can poorly implement the best curriculum in the world, or you could implement the worst one the best way possible, and you both, both lead to bad outcomes, right? right. So I was going to ask tonight if it was possible to do an extended pilot. And I know Dr. McComas said that that would be kind of the backup plan. Can you talk more about what that might look like? Yeah, so I will, uh, what we can do is move forward and, and bring this in. And, and really our pilot work is that, that very intensive engagement with our teachers to hear how is it going with implementation? What do we need to do to support? So it's not a, do you like it or do you not like it? It's how do we make this work the best we can make it work for our folks and our students? Um, and so at that, I'm gonna turn it over to sure. the team here to talk about how does that come to life and how does that look like? And, and um, thank you for bringing up implementation. And I know when Dr. Um, Williams talks about written and taught, the taught is where that implementation um, rubber meets the road and is critically important. Um, I want to talk to say two things before I answer your question about the extended pilot and what our backup plan would be um, I also want to talk about our professional development plan so part of what we are able to do because of the um, board calendar reflecting many more professional learning days um, we have three out of the four next fall for us to be able to offer um, where teachers are paid it is mandatory which has sometimes been a challenge with professional learning when we have to pay outside um, and because we have those multiple professional learning days where we can devote three full days to supporting teachers with implementation, we also have a plan for different entry points. Mm -hmm. So we are going to offer that schools can start on day one. And we have some schools that are chomping at the bit, begging, I'm getting emails right now <laughs> from principals asking me for this. We also are offering to schools that if they wanna wait until after two of those professional learning days, they could start at the end of the first marking period. And that would be a natural entry point that would not disrupt the learning for students. And then we have also offered an entry point at the end of the first semester. And so that is a way of extending this on-ramp, if you will. It gives us an opportunity to focus on implementation, to onboard new teachers, to support the 37 new leaders that were named this evening with understanding. Um, and it also allows for principals to work with their community of teachers to make a plan for that extension. That is across the board. Now our backup plan. Every school that I visited with the pilot said to us, but you're not gonna take this away from us, are you, if this doesn't go forward? In order for me to extend the pilot in any way, I still need a contract because I would not be able to replenish consumables, nor would I be able to follow students. So in other words, we had some schools that piloted K to two. They have asked me if this does not go forward full implementation the way that they want, can I at least keep it for my third grade, my K to three, so that students that began and invested in this at the end of second grade have that pathway. I cannot do that if I don't have a contract because I would be limited by the spending authority. Um, so our backup plan, should this not go forward, 
um, is to work with that. However, I will tell you that we'll have incredible challenges because then we will have data points where we have different schools using different curricula, which will make it very difficult to, to have conversations around that. Um, it will also still require us to continue to make changes to the curriculum that's in place because I will have some students using a curriculum that I know doesn't align to standards. So it's possible and we will certainly do our best to work with schools, whatever the decision is this evening. Um, but I just wanted to also be transparent about some of the challenges that would present. So different schools having different curriculum is a great way to evaluate the, how well it's working. So I, I, don't, I don't have as big of an issue with that. Um, I just have an issue bringing something to scale that hasn't, we, where we haven't ironed out the implementation. You said teacher training, this, how the students access you know, the, the things online. All that stuff needs to be ironed out before we bring it to scale. And I, that's where I get a little bit hung up with the super small pilot that we did. Um, and, and that's kind of what's going on in my head. All the evidence I've seen, I've heard tonight, was super anecdotal. Emails, teachers love it, here's a quote. You know, like that's not evidence, and that's not even implementation evidence. It's not even feasibility data. It's none of, none of those metrics that tells you how well it was implemented. Right, so some of the evidence, though, that we brought forward is from other states that had a full year and is from national evaluation tools that is hard metrics, that is based on um, assessment data. You're right, I don't have state assessment data to show the no. implementation. Um, the other challenge that I have, again, if we were talking about two highly rated evidence-based curricula and one school is using this, and, and that's where we often talk about implementation science when you're comparing two products. But we're talking about some students having a curriculum that we know is not aligned and is nine years old. And that becomes more challenging when you're thinking about that. Oh, that could be a storm. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it... <laughs> oh, it's an amber alert. Oh, an amber alert. Um, that's serious too, an amber. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a child, right? Yeah. Um, I just, I again, I, I, it gives me pause to to bring something to scale that we have. And, and implementation data isn't outcome data to me. It's how well it's being implemented, sure. and that that's where I'm like getting hung up because it's the core curriculum. It's like the most important basis of what we're doing. Correct. And I just, I don't want to, you know, get too far ahead of ourselves before we understand how to best implement it, which to me would require. Um, an extended pilot, and that's, and, and, that's where I and am. I just want to make sure that I underscore that I can't do an extended pilot if this contract doesn't pass, because I would be limited by the spending authority that I wouldn't have without a contract. So I, I just need to make sure that that's clear too. I appreciate your point, and, and we would always work with whatever the decision of the board is to support our schools. I just have two last comments. One is that um, I can't fathom that a funder for the Maryland Leads program would withdraw funding if we said, we didn't feel that it was ready to bring to scale. Like that sounds really odd to me that a funder would pull out money um, if you were honest that you needed more um, time to understand the implementation. And frankly, the, politiz the politicization, I can't say that word, but I'm so tired, of this contract I find very disturbing. It, that, like all the comments, all that's happening with this $10 million contract, I find all of it, the talking points, very disturbing. That's all I have to say. So if I may, um, what, what I believe would happen with the Maryland Leeds grant, I don't know if they would pull the funding or not. What I know is that that was the only question that they asked us. And what they were proposing when, when school systems applied for the science of reading, some school systems applied for the funds to pay for a new evidence-based curriculum. And so what I'm underscoring is that they told us that in order to apply for the science of reading, you had to either apply for funding for those three strategies or demonstrate through evidence that you already had that in place because we applied for funding for strategy A, which was about professional learning. Sorry. Because we applied for strategy A, which was professional learning, they asked us what evidence we had around the evidence-based curriculum, and we told them about this plan. So that's what I'm, 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 I'm explaining. Wait, and I will also point out that I did uh, send to all of you, I think it was last Thursday afternoon, um, the actual letter of conditional approval that require that has those conditions, and that is one of those conditions. So, and sorry, because my brain's not working. The if this if this contract is not funded, we cannot move forward with this program ever in the future, or just no, until the next meeting when we revisit the different contract. Yeah, so, what I was offering is that without a contract with a vendor, we're limited to fifty thousand dollars as based on our procurement rules. And so in order for me, even just keep it in the 27 schools, 5,000 students, 274 teachers for next year, it would require me replenishing consumables. If I also then tried to add the rising grade level to support those students, I would exceed the $50,000. So for example, in order to stay under that this year in the pilot, we didn't purchase the big books for some of our kindergarten teachers. So what I'm offering is that even to do an extended pilot really well, 
I still need a contract. I don't need necessarily the same spending authority, but I do still need a yeah, contract. Yeah, so you could go back to the company and Correct. ask them for an extended pilot style contract, which would And I would, would have different. to change the, um, the terms, but I would still need a contract right. because it would go beyond 50,000. That's what I was trying to explain. Yeah, but it's not impossible. Correct. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? I'm just an ordinary guy trying to figure this out. <laughs> I've got a question about the funding, and then I got something else to say. So this money was in the original bat that county council voted against, correct? You are correct. Okay, so now you're going to resubmit a second bat to them? Is that correct? That is, we, yes, we are, yes. Okay, That's I'd be shocked if they vote for that. But it's just my opinion. It's strictly my opinion right. because they're, this is an election year, and they're not going to change up, in my opinion. So then you don't have funding. So if you don't have funding, Dr. McComas, do you have money within that you can shift around to keep that going or no? Uh, yes. So my contingency plan is if we are not able to get any money in, fun in the BAT, uh, what I will do is I will use my own uh, CNI, the maintenance of effort funding that comes to me to buy uh, materials of instruction. It means we will use what we have to get as far as we can. So that means that you can keep the pilot going in the fall for X number of weeks? Yes. We, again, we could continue to move forward with the pilot. The scale, of course, would be different. Uh, we would have to address some of the things that Ms. Shea just talked about, about replenishing consumables. Um, and so we would use the funds that we have. Um, and again, that for those who want to pump the brakes, so to speak, um, and slow down the, the pilot, uh, it would be on a smaller scale because it's, I don't have that amount of money okay. to put forward out of my operating budget. So you could do that even without the contract that Ms. Ms. No. No, I still need the contract. So keep in mind, there's the money, and then there's the permission to, to contract with this company and purchase the materials. Ideally, I could have the, the BAT funds as the money, but I still need the contract. Okay. You need both to make it happen. You, okay. It's not a one exclusive, mutually exclusive. Now, I'm trying to under... Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add, um, if we do not move forward with the adoption of MyView Literacy, we do have a pretty significant expense to keep the lights on with the Wonders Not Aligned nine-year-old curriculum. So every year we pay, I, I believe it's close million. to a million dollars to continue access to that. So if we don't move forward with my view for all classrooms, we'll still have to expend that money to keep Wonders going for the other schools, as well as use some of the funds that Dr. McComas could reallocate for this pilot. So I just want to make that clear as well. Okay. It, it seems pretty obvious that we need something. Yes. And what we have for the last nine years is not doing the job. We're not doing that. But what I don't understand is why this is so polarizing. Now, is it the $10 million? And maybe you can't answer this. Is it the topics of these stories that the kids are reading? Are people are threatened by, the, by those stories? Why, why is it so polarizing? That's a great question, and I, too, do not understand, because we all recognize that our, our student achievement is unacceptable. We recognize that the curriculum we have is not to standards. Uh, we recognize that we need to have more rigorous instruction in the classroom, and we're bringing forward a product to address that need. So I truly do not understand what is so polarizing about it. Now, I can certainly, I respect your, your thoughts when we'd like to see a, a longer um, pilot. The only reason our pilot was the length it was was because we were fighting, um, you know, the Omicron uh, variant uh, so much. And, and in fact, I just looked at the day today, we, we, we sent three, uh, we, we provided 3,017 co uh, coverages uh, in the spring semester. Uh, and so that truly was the only thing that uh, restricted uh, the length of that pilot was in response to the pandemic. But I, too, Mr. McMillian, genuinely do not understand. We have followed every proper procedure. Uh, we have brought this to this table in, in, with expertise and good faith to be able to provide higher quality instruction every day for our students and more cohesive resources for our teachers that actually will, in the long run, make it easier for them. So I, too, do not understand. And, and you say that kids enjoy reading these stories. And, and the classes that I was in, that's the way that appeared. That's the feedback the students shared with us as well in the pilot. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Thank you. 
Uh, first of all, Dr. Williams, thank you for breaking it down and explaining it as you did. We are here for instruction and education. Thank you for stating that we don't, we're not here to fix students, we're here to teach students. Ms. Kraft, Ms. Shea, Dr. McComas, you have done an incredible job explaining this ad nauseum. Uh, Dr. McComas and team, you've answered dozens of questions from the board members. You've invited folks to visit and we've had analysis, paralysis, data breakdown, but it doesn't matter. Um, you, I heard you say you cannot do an extended pilot, but that, that means we would have a piecemeal curriculum and you would expend $9 million for keeping the lights on wonders going. Uh, people were talking about the science of reading and nobody, and I'm going to repeat this, nobody on this board is an expert or has spent a minute of their lives writing or reading curriculum. We have a board that will debunk evidence-based research in favor of Facebook bro group research, conspiracy theories, a board that will continue to make uneducated decisions for our children. Um, and, you know, I, I want to talk about people saying it's polarizing or political folks making statement that they want African-American children to read, apart from the tone deafness of that statement, uh, they're roadblocking something that will help. And I, what is it? It's systemic racism. This is not an opinion, right, Dr. Shea? Ms. Shea, this is a fact. I have, I've been reading and writing four languages since I was 10, and I speak five. When I saw this, it gave me hope that finally a well-rounded curriculum for my children. And anybody that votes no on this really needs to reevaluate their um, presence on this board because none of us are educators and you have experts saying that Time. this is well thank you and thank, thank you Dr. Uh, McComas thank you Ms. Jose. Um let's see who's next board members um, I believe Ms. Causey you have 25 seconds you were next thank, <clears throat> thank you um Going back to Public Works recommendations, there were several related to uh, curriculum and instruction, including um, creating, excuse me, <clears throat> recommendation 8.31 about uh, written criteria, standard operating procedures for the selection um, of curriculum. Also, um, Public Works. Recommendation 8 35, which is on page okay, 400. Mrs. Cozy, that's time. Just uh, to be clear, we did follow procedures. I think we did. <laughs> and public works recommendations. I think that's what Ms. Cozy was getting at in her question. So we already had standard operating procedures for the curriculum. Right. Ms. Scott? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know, because you, you said you were with Montgomery County, um, or had been, um, um, for the 18th month pilot, do they have a contract? So uh, I'm going to speak to the secondary part of that question. I don't want to speak for the elementary just because I would hate to misspeak. Um, for the secondary pilot, we... Um, actually did have a contract and we put it in, in um, this, we phased it in. And so we were calling it a pilot, but we actually had a contract and we had purchased it. Um, and then we did it in waves um, in terms of putting it into schools over a three year period. And what year? Um, Sorry, the pandemic made everything and I'm trying to think now. So we would have started, that must have been in 2018. Okay, for COVID. Um, and just, uh, if you all could just say, what are you gonna do if this doesn't pass? It's a very difficult question, Ms. Scott. And um, I mean, of course, we're gonna do whatever we have to do to support our teachers and students. Um, if this contract does not pass, the schools that have currently piloted have made several requests to me that they be allowed to continue. Yeah. I would, spend up to $49,999 to get them the materials that I could to support the schools in that way. Um, I would ex continue to extend that pilot for, for those schools. 
Um, I would also, my team would have to go in and make some changes again to the current curriculum that we know doesn't meet standards to try to be responsive to current data and try to make improvements, uh, particularly with writing. We haven't talked a lot about writing, but writing is something that this board has asked me about many times um, that we do need to work on and that this curriculum would provide. Um, so my curriculum team would have to work to uh, support the current BCPS curriculum to supplement that. Um, I would have to go back to MSDE and let them know that this contract did not move forward um, to be able to proceed with Maryland Leeds. Um, and I would have to come back. I, I, I mean, I, I can't not have a core curriculum that aligns to standards because that's the law. So at some point, I would need to either start the RFI process all over again, or I would come back and, and hope for a different outcome. Uh, so to be honest, I. I don't really know <laughs> other than I will do whatever it takes to support the students and teachers. Go ahead. Um, and well, I was just going to add on to what Ms. Shea was saying. And um, I think that I just want to underscore we're, we're going to pay a million dollars for a product that we know that is not aligned, that is not on, you know, not uh, rated on ed reports as meeting standard. Um, and additionally, we would have to do a lot of upgrades this summer on the existing curriculum. Um, with some software being removed, some of our writing lessons that are incomplete. So there would be a lot of work to continue to piecemeal a curriculum that we already know isn't working based on multiple data points, not just one. Um, and, and interestingly enough, someone was asking about other districts. So I had a chance to actually talk to two district leaders without the vendor present just to say, okay, tell me a little bit about implementation. They were both in year two. Um, and I was really hard pressed. I kept saying to, they kept telling me all these wonderful things. I'm like, no, but I really wanna know what's not working. Tell me what's not working. And I was really hard pressed to get anything from them about what's not working as they're in year two of full implementation. And so, you know, again, I'm just thinking about even the equity of, and of course, like Ms. Shea said, we will do what we need to do for our students. We will make what needs to happen happen. We are creative individuals. However, I think we also get into an equity issue of who is going to get this new curriculum that is aligned to standard, that is rigorous, that does provide scaffolding, that provides supports for multilingual learners, that does all those things, and then who gets to have the curriculum that we've already decided doesn't aligned to standards and is not rated um, proficiently by ad reports. Okay, thank you. Ms. Mack, did you have a question? You had time remaining? No, okay, we were just asking about that. Um, let's see who's next. Ms. Causey, you're out of time. Uh, Mr. Thomas, you were next. Thank you, Ms. Hen. So we've heard from teachers that they need to create new resources with this new curriculum. Can you either validate that or counter that? Sure. Um, so if we're referencing some of the um, original Facebook posts and some teachers out of state, many of the resources that were described as being supplemented have to do with the foundational skills portion of the My View Literacy curriculum, and we are not using that because we have open court. Um, the second piece that I will offer is that um, in terms of the expectations set forth for the system, there would be no expectation that teachers have to supplement. Anything that um, other districts have identified as needing to be supplemented that were included in some of the um, ratings were things like uh, cross-disciplinary resources. We already have that. We have DBQ project in elementary social studies. We have the science and social studies offices working together to integrate. Mm -hmm. Um, some district teachers in other districts have talked about having to supplement with um, something called the Hegarty book for phonemic awareness. Again, that's foundational skills. We wouldn't have to do that here. Um, in some grade levels, they talk about wanting to supplement with additional readers at different texts that represent culturally relevant text. Um, we've already purchased libraries in some of our previous. So there would be no expectation or requirement that teachers would need to supplement this curriculum in BCPS based on the resources that we have. In addition, we're fortunate that we have a central office team that supports our teachers. And so included in some of the resources that we provided to the board and that we provided to the pilot, um, our team creates um, newsletters that go with each unit mm -hmm. that help to pull some of those resources together for teachers. Um, we also have created unit planners that identify for teachers that scope and sequence so that they can see at a glance all those different pieces as they're learning a new curriculum. That said, I'm a teacher and I know that 
there will still be teachers that do things to help make it come to life. One of the things Mr. McMillian talked about is even though we saw the same lesson in several different classrooms, teachers have personality. That's part of the art of teacher. So there will be teachers that will supplement, that will, um, one teacher we walked into our classroom and she had hand drawn an organizer for note taking. And I said to her, did the curriculum not provide you with an organizer for note taking? And she said, no, I just liked this one because I had used it with my students in a different unit early in the year and I wanted them to have consistency. That's still gonna happen because that's part of the art of teacher. But in terms of system expectations, teachers will not have to supplement this curriculum. If there's anything else that needs to be integrated, that will be a part of the central office support with resources we already have in place that I mentioned. Okay, and with the current curriculum, are teachers having to do a lot of supplementary work? Yes, so uh, one of the quotes I will just share from the um, teachers is um, one of the pilot teachers said, um, this gave me back my weekends. Mm -hmm. um, our teachers are incredibly hardworking and we have asked them to do an incredible amount of shifting and changing. Pivot has become a bad word. Um, in the current curriculum, we've had to do a lot of supplementing and the teachers are right. They have spent too, too many hours having to search for resources. Um, teachers will still have to plan in this curriculum. Our teachers always have to plan because they know their students and we're trying to serve our students. Um, but they will not have to Google other resources. They will not have to find them or pull them from other resources. Currently, they do. Currently, we have built a curriculum where every year we try to supplement, as Ms. Kraft said, if this does not go forward, we know that some of our writing lessons are gonna have to be changed because of software that students will not be able to access on the Chromebook. Um, the teachers are gonna have to shift because we'll have to change those because we aren't, if we aren't successful in moving. Um, teachers, that's probably the number one complaint. Um, for several years, teachers have asked in this nine years, why won't you let us just follow Wonders? We have this Wonders curriculum, why won't you let us just follow this instead of adding all the supplemental resources? But the reason for that is because Wonders is not highly rated. We already know from these ed reports that it's not um, aligned fully aligned to the standards. Thank you, and how modifiable are the resources that the teachers have? So what's great about My View Literacy, and in fact, one of the teachers shared with us that she didn't know that until she came to one of our focus group <laughs> sessions. Um, teachers have access to all of the PDF resources, but they're editable. So that same teacher, in fact, a teacher that had hand drawn the organizer, and I stopped to talk to her and said, tell me why you did that. Um, I then said to her, did you know that you could take the organizer that My View provides and you can edit it for your students? And she hadn't learned that piece yet. Um, they're incredibly receptive. The other thing that I will offer um, is that um, the company itself is very responsive to feedback, which isn't always um, typical with large vendors. And so for example, previous um, feedback that another state had identified um, was about there wasn't enough opinion writing and that that's an important part of the Common Core. And so the company actually developed supplemental units at every grade level K to two on opinion writing. Um, so I think there's also that opportunity to be responsive in that way as well. Thank you, and what was the pilot for Bridges and for Open Core? How long was the pilot for that? So the, um, that's a great question. The Bridges pilot was also cut short because of the pandemic. So we had started it in November. Um, the teachers did continue using Bridges, but of course in March, everything was different. And so the way that we were piloting it changed dramatically. Um, so that was pretty brief in terms of in the classroom, what we were able to pilot, but we continued to use the Bridges digital content once we shifted. Um, the open court pilot was longer, it was a year. And of course that was pre-pandemic. Okay, thank you so much hearing this, the presentation from the curriculum committee. I fully support this and again, I hope that our board will as well. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for visiting the classroom. Dr. Hager. I think this sounds like a very promising core curriculum. I think scaling too fast could ruin, ruin it for years though. And so I strong, if it doesn't pass, please bring back a, an extended pilot contract. That's all I ask that, um, yeah, I worry about scaling too fast. I appreciate you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Board members, I think um, we've had ample time for discussion. <laughs> <laughs> thank you to the team. Is it tomorrow yet? Yeah. I mean, I don't <laughs> three minutes. Okay. So perhaps we can okay. call a vote before in the PM still. Um, call a vote before in the we're, PM. I believe there is a motion on the floor that did not need a second. Was that yours, um, Mr. Offerman? It was mine. Or Mr. Yeah. Thomas, you made the motion to approve. Mr. Um, Offerman? Yes. Yes, thank Mr. Thomas, Thomas made, made it. it. Thank you. 
Um, so the motion, in case we forgot, was to approve item M2. Um, it was made by Mr. Thomas. Ms. Gilbert, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Um, uh, no, but I'll be making a motion if oh. after the vote. Thanks. So your vote is no. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. Yes. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Yes. Offerman? Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Offerman? Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Hen? No. Favor is five. Okay. The motion fails. Ms. Causey, did you have a motion you wanted to make related to this contract? Yes. Yes. Or something else? Uh, no, related to this. Okay, go ahead. Can you put your motion, is your motion in the chat? Yes. I'm sorry, is this related to this contract? Um, I move to approve the contract for an amount to extend the pilot for another quarter. I'm sorry, I, I'm not seeing that motion in the... We, we would need this brought back to the board as another recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next item. Ms. Hen. Is this regards to yes. this contract? Yes. Please make it quick. Mr. Thank Mr. you. I move that another MyView contract be brought to the board for a pilot for another quarter. And this is different from Ms. Causey because it's not approving a contract. It's moving that a contract be brought forward for a pilot. Okay. Um, Dr. For another Williams. year. Sorry. It's supposed Thank to say you. year. Dr. Williams, is a motion, I'm going to consult with Dr. Williams on this, is a motion necessary? for staff to bring back um, another contract for consideration for uh, an extended pilot. I would look to purchasing and Mr. Hargrove on that, your uh, recommendation. No, I'm sorry. Um, good evening or good morning. Um, no, there is not a motion. If, if we would discuss this with the uh, curriculum office and if that was there, wish we would bring this back okay. for, a, for an extended pilot. Thank you. Okay, so the board can't make the motion to require that? The general mechanism is staff bring rec contract recommendations to the board. So if it is based on the discussion tonight, I don't believe we need a formal action of the board to um, communicate to staff and to Dr. Williams that it's our interest in considering um, a recommendation um, contract recommendation to pilot the my view for another quarter. Oh, I didn't know that that was the agree. That's what the whole board agreed with. I know one board member stated that. Consideration. Are there any objections to staff considering this? I'm not sure um, I'm following this. Doc, so there's interest in pi extending the pilot for another quarter, which would require bringing a modified contract recommendation back to the board. Right. So I, I completely hear everyone's OK with us ex continuing the pilot. I hear that. Interest in that. Yes. Right. The contract is written, of course, for a five-year spending authority. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you want us to bring back a modified contract with a different spending authority? Because we will continue the pilot. I, I guess, like, we don't need the... The contract doesn't give us permission to pilot. We are piloting, and we will extend that pilot because we. I do hear everyone is optimistic about we'd like to see a longer pilot. I think, yeah. If I understand correctly, if the interest is in extending the pilot, we would need a contract right. to so allow me to spend beyond $50,000. So is the ask to come back with a contract with a different spending authority reflecting what I need for an extended pilot with a yes. different duration. Right? Yes. yes. 
So, right, so it's. That we okay. do not need formal board action, but that that is what the board seems to be interested in considering. Extending the pilot and considering a modified spend authority to, can, can to allow you to consider the pilot. Can I ask clarification pilot. on that? I, I don't really know what we're doing right now, so I don't even know who to yeah, ask. Yeah, like, what, what is with it? Robert's <laughs> rules, I'm I, sure. I don't know, but like, do I raise my hand? But I have some questions about that. <laughs> well, I, I think we could, the board can provide direction through Dr. Williams okay. for, for that. Sure. Yeah. Thank okay, you. thank you. I'd love that we were sure. to clarify that the whole board wants to see that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. One moment to collect my phone. And we're, yes, I'm. Um, the next item on the agenda is the fiscal year 2022 budget appropriation transfer. And for that, I call back Mr. Hartloff. And um, in uh, knowing the, the, the time, I'll just summarize uh, three things about the BAT. Uh, number one, we must align our FY22 operating budget, the current year budget, via this BAT. Uh, to our actual expenditure. So there's part of this bat is a mandatory item that we have to have. We can't go over, we can't overspend in certain areas. And just to remind the board, what, we, what we've what we been doing during the year is doing BLTs that we pass through the budget committee. They're passed, so all this has been approved, but we have to, then we final, we, we summarize that, put it into a, the, BA, the, B, the bat, and that gets approved. So that is kind of a, a thing that we have to do. That's number one. Number two, there's nothing that's in this bat that wasn't in the previous bat. So you do, we're not putting anything additional in. And then the last thing, the third thing, is in order to address the concerns of the um, county council, we have reduced the bat by $10.3 million. We did try to, uh, we, and we so we, we, we moved away from moving any dollars out of transportation. We moved away from moving any dollars into administration, which was kind of a misnomer because all of our technology runs through administration, but that administration kind of, they didn't like the word, so we kind of reduced out of there as well. But we were able to save the dollars for for these curriculum items. So that's why, so it's not, I understand your point. It's not, we're not bringing back the exact same thing. We're bringing back a reduced version of it. And that's gonna be our best attempt. Uh, the only other thing we could do is just bring back just solely the, um, the movements to correct, um, to correct the, uh, the, the categorical totals. So that's, that's a summary of what this, what this does. Okay, I have one question and then I'll open it up to sure. my colleagues for discussion. Um, when you say that we are not moving out of transportation, could you please elaborate on that and how that's changing, that's specific, that's the, their right. biggest concern. So. One of the, th one of the, when you're, a bat is a moving dollars within the budget. We're not getting any additional dollars, we're just moving them. Bent. Yes, we're just moving dollars that were unspent. We do our budget well in advance of the fiscal year. We do our best, but sometimes um, we don't nail it. And in this case, we had a lot of reasons. We had, you know, all the, the reasons that you know, the bus driver shortage causing us to spend less in transportation. So the, 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 you know, the thing that, that I said to the, the, the council is, is we're not reducing the, the, the we're, not, we're not reducing, we're, we made every effort we could to try to spend those dollars on transportation, we just couldn't. So then as we get close to the end of the year, we say, okay, what opportunities do we have? And the opportunities were things like technology and curriculum. And that's what we were doing. But because of that kind of sensitivity, we said, okay, we can't come back with another bat that, no pun intended, but the bat that they beat us up with, <laughs> just doing the same thing again. We can't just bring the same bat back. So we have to address some of their concerns. So we addressed the two concerns that we heard the loudest were um, taking dollars from transportation. We're no longer, leave, transportation budget is, remaining as is, and those dollars just will just go unspent and will roll into our fund balance. And then we're also reducing the amount of dollars that are going into administration, although it's not really administration, it's technology. Okay, so as a follow, thank you. So as a follow up then, there are no opportunities then to invest those unspent dollars in transportation into 
anything else that will improve the reliability or safety of student transportation? Not in the two weeks we have left in the, yeah, that's, Thanks. this is all for the current fiscal year. So Four those dollars will go back into fund balance. And, you know, if there is a need in transportation, and I've talked regularly with uh, Dr. Yarbrough about ways that we can try to, uh, when we have, we have fund, but we have dollars. Um, our problem has not necessarily always been dollars. Um, it's sometimes there's other bigger issues out there like driver shortages and, um, you know, so so there are things that we'll try to do uh, u utilizing fund balance and dollars that were remaining in the transportation budget. So we, we don't have the ability to forward fund things such as increased salaries or anything we might anticipate increasing our investments in transportation to recruit drivers. No, for but next you could. Year. No, you, you you can't spend dollars this year for next year. But those dollars that flow through into fund balance, we could then say, okay, back these towards towards transportation. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions, board members? Ms. Mack, the bat has a reference to the my view contract. What happens now? Well, as as. Uh, Dr. McComas uh, mentioned, we need two things in order to, to spend dollars. We need the dollars in the right place, which this does, but the other thing we need is a contract. Without the contract, we can't. So it, it, it's not gonna, it's not like a back end into being able to do this. You don't have to, you can leave that in. We just can't spend it uh, because we don't have a contract in place. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Thank you. <clears throat> So for this bat, um, there's uh, 922,000 is included for digital content for programs like Read 180, System 44, Wilson Language Live, HD Words. All of these products have uh, previously had contracts approved by the board from 2018 through 2021 with a total spending authority of 3.2 million. So the bat states that we have not exhausted the spending authority on these contracts. Um, so why is that component of the request necessary? It's the, that's that same, that same uh, thing I just said before is that in order to um, be able to procure something, we need the spending authority, but we also need the dollars. So this yeah. is, so you, you, we, you are correct. We have the spending authority, but the dollars are not in the right place. So this bat puts the dollars in the right place to be able to spend them on those contracts we have in place. So who is um, trained and using these products? That's, um, oh, here we go. Okay. I didn't lose you. <laughs> I can't answer that one. Hello. Oh, this chair's lower. Hello. Um, hi, Ms. Causey. So we have um, teachers who have participated in training at the secondary level. Each of these resources you've identified are part of our uh, reading intervention model that we've collaborated on with the Office of ELA and the Office of Special Education. Um, in order for uh, schools to offer each of these programs, it's a requirement that teachers have to attend training. Um, some of these are special educators, some of them are reading teachers. Um, it would depend on the staffing at the school. So th these have already been vetted and used and they're evidence-based for raising the bar and then closing the achievement gaps as Correct. intervention. These, these programs that you just identified are specifically for secondary literacy intervention programs. So they would mostly focus on closing the gaps um, that have been identified that students are enrolled in a course specifically because they have an identified need in literacy. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Board members? Madam Chair, do we need to make a um, motion to amend the bat given the um, vote on that other curriculum um, resource? Mr. Hartloff, is that necessary? I, I, no, I don't believe it's, it's necessary. Okay. Thank you. Hearing no, no other questions or comments. Um, Ms. Well, Ms. Hen, so I, so I guess my motion, question is, I'll... excuse me, we're asking for a bat for materials that aren't approved. So is there something else that would be helpful for us to align funding? I, I, I think at this point, we're probably, 
I use the terminology 11th hour. I think we're in the 12th hour. We're, we're, we, need to, we need to get this one going. So I would say, I would say we're good as is. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the fiscal year 2022 budget appropriation transfer? So moved. Oh, wait. Never mind. Second, Offerman. Um, we need it. I'll take that as a first, Mr. Offerman, or a motion. I'll second it. Um, yes. Dr. Hager I'll for the it. second. Um, may I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Um, Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Are you going to wait for Mr. McMillian? It's the right now. He's right here. Mr. McMillian? Mr. McMillian? Yes, on the back. Your vote on the back? We're voting on the back? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. The motion carries. Okay. It's in the nick of time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Did we, did we drop all? No, we kept all. We kept all. Okay. Is there a motion to postpone item R1 to the next meeting? So moved. Hager. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Is there a second? Second, Mac. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Any discussion? I do. May I have a I'm asking, I want to ask our, I mean, is this going to hinder this, what our, our curriculum office can do? Can they, they're not able to, are they going to be able to work on these courses th throughout July and August? Yes, please. Okay, I mean, the, if they need, need this, then I'm not going to support that. It's really fast, okay. but I need to be able to enter it in the master course file for scheduling. Do I withdraw or do we vote no? Yes, do you withdraw? I withdraw, your, yeah. Sure. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Mack, do you withdraw your second? Unfortunately, I just put my laptop away. Ms. Causey, can you, is Ms. Causey the vice chair? No. Yes, that would be perfect. Do you want to use mine? Okay. Do you withdraw your second? Yes. Okay. Got to make it official. Um. Ms. Mack is introducing this agenda item. We're not having this. Oh, Ms. Mack is introducing I did not know Ms. Mack was. I thought, I'm sorry. I apologize. Thank you so much. Ms. Mack, we're whenever she's ready, thank you. Agenda item. She didn't have her computer Thank ready. you. I did not realize Ms. Mack was presenting. She is. As outlined in policy and rule 6000, each year staff from the Division of Curriculum Instruction present new courses of study for approval. At the May Curriculum Committee meeting, staff presented an overview of new, changed, and deactivated courses for the 2022 20 school year and beyond. Courses being developed span multiple academic content areas including, for example, new courses in CTE, dance, fine arts, math, music, science, social studies, and special education. Proposed changes and proposed changes to college and career readiness, math, and social studies. Deactivation of two courses in math. In May, the Board Curriculum Committee voted unanimously to approve these new and proposed course offerings, and I submit them today to the full Board for approval as outlined in Policy and Rule 6000. May I have a motion to approve the Curriculum Committee's recommendation on the proposed changes to curricula for the 22-23 school year? So moved, Thomas. No second is needed as it comes from committee. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Jose? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Road the motion Ms. passes. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the 2022-2023 organizational, organizational chart per board policy 2310. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. 
So, board, um, do you have a copy of the proposed FY23 organizational chart? If you recall, back in October, on October 26 of 2021, I provide the revised cabinet, a reduction of the revised cabinet. And uh, according to policy 2310, uh, I am showing those direct reports uh, at executive director level and above for your consideration. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the 2022-2023 organizational chart? So move, Thomas. Per board policy 2310. So move, Thomas. Is there a second? Second, Hager. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Causey? Ms. I Causey? Put the chat. I have a question, but I'll just make it a comment and not a question. Is that okay, Madam Chair? Go for it, Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Williams for uh, bringing this forward. Um, and I wanted to appreciate all of the work that has been done by uh, Dr. Williams and staff and also community members participating in the focus groups to implement the public works recommendations, which is all about providing effective educational instruction and opportunities to our children and supporting the teachers, staff, administrators that are necessary for that academic achievement to happen. And I look forward to the additional information uh, that Dr. Williams uh, will be providing the board in, in fulfillment of uh, the recommendations, including job descriptions. And it is also recommended that we modify the current 2310 because just a few short years ago, the board would approve the organization chart for the entire school system. Um, so thank you and I will be voting to support this. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? We're doing the vote. We're voting. I said we were in the process of the vote. Yeah. Point to four. I thought we were in the middle we of a vote. We were in the middle of a vote. Ms. Oh. Causey? It's late. I'm sorry. Thank you. Ms. Causey? Your vote? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Joes? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Scott? For the last time. Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you. Item T was postponed and yes. item V yes. as well, yes. correct. That brings us to the next item is information. Um, information items include the financial report for April 2022, the Compass Spring 2022 update, the revised 2021-2022 school calendar, which reflects the June 20th closure in observance of Juneteenth, Revised Superintendent Rules 2373, 3410, and 4303, and the updated Students Count 2021. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The Board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, July 12th, 2022, at 6.30 p.m. He wasn't removed. He was, he was not removed. Um, we have one other item of business. May I have a motion to postpone item V, board committee reports, member comments, and agenda setting? So moved, Matt. Second, Hager. Thank you. Any concerns? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for your patience. The meeting's now adjourned.